Welcome in, everyone. Hello, everybody. This is Everything Sucks. Let's Fix It, episode 37. My name is Ben Mayer. My name is Anthony Buono. Today is February 27th, 2024. We had a South Carolina primary. Big deal. Just this weekend. Well, most of the time. Most of the time is a big deal. Yeah. We have some things that we can take from it, though. No, listen. There's definitely analysis to be done. Yeah. Um, the head, the top line results are Donald Trump beat Nikki Haley. No surprise there. 60% to 40%. Yeah. I got to say, I'm shocked she got all the way up to 40, 39.5. Yeah, this is better than we were seeing in the polling averages before the election. Yeah. yeah. It seemed like the polling was like pretty accurate at seeing like the number that Trump was going to get. Mm. But it just seemed like all the undecideds broke for Nikki Haley. Which makes sense, I think. Right. I also, one of the things that the exit polls did say is of voters who chose who to vote for in the last month, they overwhelmingly picked Haley. There you go. Yeah. There you go. See, so she, well, she's coalesced whatever anti-Trump movement there is in the Republican Party behind her. Right? Yeah. She's effectively done that. Mm-hmm. And where she did well, it was exactly where we thought she was going to do well, right? She did really well in Columbia and she really, did she, she did really well in Charleston. These are both Democrat areas, more educated areas, yeah. more independent areas, wealthier areas, more um, urban, more urban, more suburban. And she kind of, you know, beat Trump there really well, really mm-hmm. effectively. Um, Trump lost a lot of ground in Colombia, and that kind of goes to show some of his weaknesses. Yeah. I don't think he's done a good enough job. I, I'm talking about Trump here. I don't think Trump has done a good enough job of bringing back those suburban suburbanites who voted for him in 2016, but then switched to Biden in 2020. I think those Republicans are still looking for someone else. Yeah. And I don't think they're going to come back home to him. Yeah. No, I think that's true. And I think in the exit polls, we do see that based on, first of all, education, right? You see a big split with uh, voters who had some college or less in their education and voters with a college degree. Haley won voters with a college degree by nine points, where Trump won voters with some college or less, 72 to 28. So he dominates those lower educated voters. But the demographics of this country aren't such that that's going to be enough for him to win in a general election. And when you break that down by gender, right, white college women, Mm -hmm. Nikki Haley's winning the white college woman vote. And I tell you, white college women, those are the people who won Democrats the House in 2018 Mm. in a large part. Also, young people in 2020, right? That's a big part of it. But really, it's Donald Trump alienating women voters. Yeah. Right? And if, listen... Then we then we then we break down to the biggest question. This is the most important one. Fox News has been asking this question in their exit poll, and this is what I've been tracking over every state. So they ask this question for each of the following. Please tell me how you would feel if if that candidate were the Republican Party's presidential nominee, Donald Trump. Sixty one percent would be very satisfied. Thirteen percent would be dissatisfied, but would still vote for him. Mm. And twenty five percent would be dissatisfied and would never vote for him. Yeah. A quarter is a lot to lose out of your primary base electorate in the general election. Yeah, and I think that's really, it's important to look at that specific question because when we're looking at this exit polling on people who are voting for Haley versus Trump, it could be easy to just say everyone who's voting for Haley is going to make up the anti-MAGA coalition that Joe Biden is going to form. But we don't know that's true, right? Like people that are voting for Haley can still definitely vote for Trump come the general. They are still both Republicans. But this gives us some insight into no a really significant portion of this group that is voting for Haley, which again, in South Carolina, an extremely red state was yes. 40% of the voters. Yeah. They want to vote Biden more than double, almost double the amount that would go back to Trump. Yes, yes. And so now with... With, with this finding here, we're saying 60% of Nikki Haley voters are not voting for Donald Trump in the general election in conservative South Carolina. Yeah. The conservative state of South Carolina. Put this in perspective, guys. Um, the In this electorate, we're talking about an electorate that was like 8% liberal, maybe like 5%, no, 5% liberal, 8% moderate, somewhere around there. Like, it was overwhelmingly a conservative, very conservative electorate. It wasn't like New Hampshire, where 50% of people were independents, mm-hmm. right? We're not, it's not that. We're talking single digit independent numbers, maybe low double. 22% digit. independents. That's what you see in the NBC poll? In the Washington different in the, Post exits. Okay. It was different in the Fox poll, but that's fine. Okay. The point is, this is, this is not supposed to be a up in the air state. Yeah. Or 60% of your party's primary is supposed to go to your opponent or sit out. Yeah, of course not. And and the point is, the 
what we really do see of Republicans or the people who say that Republicans are conservatives, the people who we know are going to vote for Trump come November, that doesn't matter. That doesn't play into our analysis of how the November election is going to go, right? What we see in these independents and how much they're moving away from Trump, that is prescriptive, I think. Oh, yeah. Um, so I think that's a big deal. The one I, I do want to point out one other interesting question result. One of the questions on the poll was, which of these four candidate qualities mattered most in deciding whom to support today? And Trump won for the top three of them. Fights for people like me, Trump won handily. Shares my values, Trump beat Haley pretty well. Can defeat Joe Biden, Trump won 55 to 45. But then 17% of respondents said that the number one quality that mattered to them was has the right temperament. And of those... 96% 96% voted for Haley and only four voted for Trump. And I feel like that perfectly encapsulates his problem. Yes. Right? That purpose, that sums it all up very, very quickly. Yeah. I mean, yeah. who are that 4% that thinks he has the right temperament? And then thinks that's the most important thing. Yeah, exactly. That's crazy to me. It is crazy. And I also, I do wonder, because I, I don't want to conflate too easily, 96% voting for Haley instead of Trump. Do you think, I don't know, something like Biden's age... Or perceptions of his age sheds a good amount off of that 96 who might probably go over to him probably okay. listen the, the main number we got to think about with regards to the general election is 25 percent republican primary goers aren't going to vote for trump yeah um and that's like not good i want to put this in perspective we talked about this on another episode but in the democrat primary 2016 very contentious between hillary clinton and bernie, mm-hmm. bernie sanders right very contentious primary and at the end of it all 10% of Democratic primary voters did not vote for Hillary Clinton, okay? And Hillary Clinton lost. Yeah. If we're talking about 25% of the Republican primary voters not voting for Donald Trump, he's just got a massive problem. To me, that seems impossible for him it, to win. It almost seems impossible. The only way that you can get around it and and like spin this as an okay thing for Trump is if you say like, okay— too many Democrats voted in the South Carolina primary this year. But that's, that's not what happened. That's not true. We see from the exit polls, Democrat, it, specifically the, the poll about party self-identification says, has a note, not enough respondents to break down details, Democrats. <laughs> that's amazing. Yeah, they just didn't go out to vote in the Republican primary. Shocker. And this, yeah, shocker. And this independent number, what did you say, 22%? Yeah. So that NBC poll, 22%, that isn't even the highest independent vote share we've seen in the south carolina primary the the best the the highest independent vote share came in 2000 between mccain and george w bush Mm, that was the highest vote share i think it was like 29 30 percent independent so now it's all the way down to 22 percent so the idea that oh this is an improper sample too many moderates and dems voted in the primary it's not what happened guys yeah i wonder also if if the republican party turmoil since trump came into office is making more independence yeah i right? bet it is because i think a lot of independents care about good governance over ideology yeah um yep. and now the democrats have really owned the good governance party yes which means those republicans are are kind of homeless as far as having a party yeah and now yeah. so what does this mean for nikki haley going forward right if if anything I mean, there's obviously no path, but yeah. what Haley has said, she's going to stay in the race. Yes. Today, there is another Republican primary in the state of Michigan. It doesn't get that much coverage. It's not that big of a deal. It's it's a it's an expensive media market. It's hard for Nikki Haley to run a good campaign up and through Michigan, but she she's given it her best shot. Um, but I think it's going to be important to see the exit polls coming out of a state like Michigan, because mm. now we're getting to swing state territory. So we've seen 25 percent of respondents say they're not going to vote for Nikki for Donald Trump. In South Carolina, I want to know what that number is in Michigan. Yeah. That's going to be very, very vital yes. in understanding, you know, what is the swing voter thinking, right? Um, in Dane County and everything. It's going to be really important. So um, now I think the only reason Haley is staying in is off the off chance that Trump ends up going to jail. Uh, I feel like that's the only reason she's there or to make a okay. name for herself, right? I, I think staying in this long is effective at making a name for herself. Oh, yeah. I think I read an article recently that was like, yeah, when if Trump loses, then Nikki Haley is going to look so good in being like, I told you so. Yes. And also, look, I was the clear alternative to him. Yes. Right? And she's, she's going to be totally she, she's going to be vindicated. Yeah. And that vindication is going to be good for her if she wants to run for president. In uh, 2028, which I think is absolutely possible given her record so far. I do think she'll run, but I also think she'll lose the primary. I also think she'll lose the primary because now now what she's done is she's betrayed Trump. Yeah. Right now she's a betrayer. But but the thing is, once she drops out, she's going to endorse him. 
So I think she might make up some of that lost ground. I got to tell you, I after watching her recent speeches, I am less convinced that she's going to endorse him. I'm like still leaning 70% that she's going to. Okay. But it's less and less each week. She just gets more and more vitriolic with the rhetoric. She goes harder and harder on him. Mm. And now she said flat out that she won't be his vice president. So that's something. Okay. I th- but then she still says that she'll pardon him if he goes to jail. Yes. So it's like, I, I just, I don't know, man. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know, I don't know either. All right. Now we are going to go to the funniest part of our show. Yes. We're going to talk about the looming government shutdown that will happen on Friday. This is the most, you know, uh, we've talked about this on almost every <laughs> podcast we've done. Yep. Unfortunately, because our government is totally paralyzed. Um. We have four days until a partial government shutdown goes into effect, um, and we currently have no plan to get out of it. There's no plan to avoid it as of right now, as of Tuesday, February 27th. No plan. No plan. As of right now, people say that there is absolutely no plan. (laughs) Okay. So this is what it is. Yeah. What gets shut down? The Departments of Agriculture, Energy, Transportation, Veterans Affairs, Housing and Urban Development, and the FDA all get impacted by certain things fda won't be able to do food inspections um there's issues with you know payments for snap and other benefits like that veteran benefits get hurt um all uh, how uh, what's the thing permits for new housing development all that gets put on standby oh. i know it's so bad so um there elizabeth warren said something really great and this is just how i feel all the time it's like what is wrong with these people this is the central thing congress is supposed to do right now the republicans can't seem to get themselves organized just to sign off on the basic work they're supposed to do this is just ridiculous now uh john tester he's a democrat senator from montana he's running in a tight re-election bid he says we're doing this every six months this is bullshit it's just bullshit and so we need to do what we were elected to do fund the government not shut it down even joe manchin a west virginia democrat the moderates moderate he's saying i swear to god it is sinful what is going on and the games that are being played right now with the american people and all the people that are depending on services of the federal government and we can't even get our act together i'm glad they're all like this angry and vocally this angry publicly yeah you know because this is how i feel i think this is how a lot of americans feel when they just see um performative nonsense see this is how i felt the last three times we came up to the <laughs> shutdown and now i can't help but laugh it's yeah. the only thing i have left yeah it's just laughter yeah i i, I but it, that should go to show you how absurd this is right right like this is this is complete like it's like in this would be in veep right it would be in like a political absurdist comedy show yes. we would see this kind of thing yes yeah yes and it, it's absurdist comedy it's almost like uh it's almost like they have a humiliation fetish yes. that's what it seems like yeah they're just keeping like they're like punching each other they're punching themselves in the balls just mm-hmm. as we look along mm-hmm. um mcconnell has come out and he's like listen it is all avoidable if the house and senate can just work together mitch mcconnell is begging mike johnson to get the ducks in a row they're like please please it's it's crazy to me that Mitch McConnell and Mike Johnson are in the same party. I know. Do th- I, do they share anything in common besides the fact that they have both attached their names to the letter R to like tax get power? cuts, bro? I guess. I guess but, tax. But cuts. do you think Mike Johnson even cares about tax cuts? Like I oh, have so no you, indication. But then this this gets into the other. This gets into the larger conversation. Yeah. What is the Republican Party? Yeah. It's a mixture of a, of a couple different things. It's a mixture of evangelicals who vote all, based off religious grounds and abortion. Mm-hmm. It's the national con- security conservatives. That's where Mitch McConnell comes in, right? But it's also the isolationists. But then it's also the isolationists and the America Firsters. Yep. Right. Who are the cultural and you know kind of ethnic reactionaries. Yeah, and then you have the uh, then you have the the tax cut business people. Yeah, right. And Mitch McConnell fits into the tax cut business person plus Social Security. Mike Johnson fits into the tax cut business person. Um, then the the abortion side. He does. He's not an isolationist, but he's also not a, a national security hawk. So mm. it's just it's yeah. a very very hodgepodge. I mean, big I mean tent. Mike Johnson is nothing. He's an evangelical. But besides that, he's just a politician. Right. Right. Like he's none of. He's not ideologically sound on anything. No, 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 no. no. Definitely not. Definitely no. not ideologically sound on anything. We'll talk about that. <laughs> Definitely not. Yeah. Um, this is what's crazy to me is two months ago, Speaker Johnson and Chuck Schumer had a funding agreement and they went behind the closed doors. They had a meeting. They sat down and they ironed out a whole 
budget agreement. It was $1.66 trillion. That was the top line. And the agreement was, okay, we're going to do the we're going to do the deal that Kevin McCarthy made to increase the debt limit, if everyone remembers that fiasco. Mm. And what you'll do in return, Mike Johnson was like, okay, Schumer, what you'll do in return for me is speed up taking money away from the IRS. And But then all that went down. And then he gets out of the room. He goes back to his call because he's like, guys, this is what I got. And everyone's like, fuck you. <laughs> you suck. Like, that was terrible. You, you know, suck. And You're he comes terrible. in excited. Yeah. Like, yeah, he's like expecting a big warm welcome. They're like, what are you doing? In there? <laughs> <It's> like, oh. <laughs> so now Schumer is like, why, why trust anything Johnson ever says? He has no power anyway. Mm-mm. It's not like anything he says means anything for the way the House will vote, how the caucus will vote, mm-hmm. how the caucus feels, how the Republican voters feel. None of it's relevant. No. So why even negotiate with Mike Johnson at this point, right? There's no reason. There is no good reason. And now because he's so he's on a leash with these hard right uh, Freedom Caucus House members, um, they sent him a letter. They sent Johnson a letter saying that if their priorities are not met, they will shut down the government. Um, flat out, multiple Republicans um, are claiming that they will shut down the government unless something is done about the border. And we have to keep in mind that Biden worked with Republicans and Democrats in the Senate to iron out a border deal that was the toughest border deal in like a decade and a half. Too tough for my liking, but I would have ate it. OK, and now they get to the House and the House Republicans light that shit on fire because Donald Trump doesn't want Biden to have a quote unquote win before yes. the election. Yes. Then that is the entire reason. No, that's the whole story. That's the whole too. story. That's yeah. the whole story. That's it. There, there's no like there's no like fundamental disagreement with the principles. It's just Donald Trump said no. And we agree. Well, the only other part of the story that I would add yeah. is the Republicans in the House specifically used the excuse that they don't need any additional laws to um, secure the border, that they just need to enforce the laws that are currently on the books. And then as soon as they shot down the law, the bipartisan border deal that Biden brought to the table, they said that we need to address our border with a law before addressing anything else. I've never seen this type of cognitive dissonance um, in my life. No. In it, politics. I just haven't seen it. Um, like, I know so I'm, clear. Right. Like, I know we're pretty young guys, but... Can you believe someone telling you one thing one day and then literally the next day having the exact opposite position? If you can find me any clip of Joe Biden doing that, please send it to me yeah. in the comments. Please, I'm begging you. If you can find it literally one day the later. Next day. Literally yeah. the next day, okay? Yeah. Don't send me something from like 20 years ago. The next day, please, please yeah. send that over because <laughs> Jesus Christ. It's nice. Um, now Johnson has two options, right? He can either do this and make a deal in the next three days, which is impossible, mm-hmm. or he can pass a continuing resolution, which is what they've been doing forever oh. over the, since this whole process started. Oh, my God. And, and what makes this so funny is Joe Biden will be proposing his 2025 budget in March 15th, which means that if he passes another continuing resolution, they will be arguing about the 2024 budget and the 2025 budget at the same time absolutely insane again i've never i've no i don't know any other time in american history where that happened <laughs> that is hilarious we are it is it's an unprecedented time we're living it's through. an unprecedented we're, we're living through history we're man. living through history every day <laughs> every day is history some days are just more fascinating than others and holy shit this republican caucus makes every day an exciting day for history but for all the wrong reasons yeah yeah it's a historically bad congress yeah and it, then i want to talk about the amount of bills that have been passed by this Congress. Yeah. I wish I don't have the chart on me right now. I'm no. so upset. But we're talking about like a 40 to 50 to 60 percent reduction yeah. in the number of bills passed by the House of Representatives compared to like the, the normal average over the last two decades. No, compared to like the next lowest number over the past two decades. Oh, my God. Yes. It is. It is so horribly below. It is. It is absolutely crazy. It is Dude. the most unproductive Congress we've probably, I think we've seen in history. Yeah. Yeah. I wouldn't be surprised unless, yeah, I wouldn't be surprised. And so now somehow people still think this election is up in the air, but after the South Carolina primary and this, I, I just, I just don't see it. Man. No, I don't see it, mm. but all right. I, it'll really be a referendum on how attentive and how, how much do American voters actually understand how government works. That is so true. And who is doing what. Because like if Don, if if people are blaming Biden for any of this, mm-hmm. they are so disconnected from what's going on. If yeah. anybody can look at the government shutdown fight and think it's Joe Biden's fault, you you are deluded. I'm sorry. You yeah. don't know what's happening. You got to You got to read more. You got to listen more. You got to figure something you out. You got to branch out your sources. Yeah. I mean, there are some people who who 
are who will just cheer for the government to be shut down. To yeah, be clear. Th- that's true. There is like a portion of the Republican Party that just like, let's see it happen. Yeah, yeah. But as far as anyone who is trying to be informed, like the media has been trying so hard to shove this down your throat that Republicans are breaking Congress. They are breaking government, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Yeah. So I we'll want to stick on Mike Johnson now, but I okay. want to go from the political angle of Johnson. So not just his ability to lead in Congress, which has been such an absolute failure, mm. but also his ability to... Re- to um to like run the election campaign to raise money to raise party. money that's like one of the most important jobs of the speaker of the house it's one big thing that we talked about when mccarthy first abdicated and johnson was picked up to be the next speaker because mccarthy's been in congress for so long he has all these connections he has support in a very rich area of california where he's yeah. from johnson has none of those things going for him so we do want to see how is that played out yeah and he is simply not a good fundraiser, mm. and it's going to damage the party's ability to perform. A lot of lobbyists who normally help Republican leaders raise money say they don't even want to work with Mike Johnson. They have they see no reason to develop a relationship with him, introduce him to all of their rich donors, because they don't know if he's going to be speaker in uh, a week, let alone two years from now. Yeah. They just don't have that type of confidence in the guy. It, well, when you have the Freedom Caucus threatening to oust the speaker every time a new budget <laughs> is about to pass. It sounds like every week. Yeah. No, it, and especially because he can't get a budget passed to even extend his lifetime yep. in the role. So all he can do is pass a continuing resolution, which means the referendum is coming up again in a month and a half. Yep. Yep, yep, yep. Doesn't every, inspire much confidence. He's always in, he's right, he's always right on the edge of losing everything. Have you seen, um, Uncut Gems by James. Yes. It feels like that. Yes. Yes. It feels yes. exactly like Uncut Gems. He's always on the edge of losing absolutely everything all yes. the time. Yes. Right? And he's always gambling. Yep. Right? Yes. It's exactly like Uncut Gems. Totally. Um, Johnson has raised $10.6 million in the last three months of 2023, um, which you would think sounds okay, but this is not as much as Kevin McCarthy brought in during any of the three quarters while he was speaker. Mm-hmm. And if you compare this to the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee, they raised $3 million, $3 million more. Dollars. $30 million more. Oh, 30 million more dollars than the NRCC last year and outraged Republicans in January. The, the, the NRCC, NRCC being the National Republican Congressional Campaign. There you go. Maybe? Yes, yeah. yes, yes. It's like the campaign arm of the of the congressional Republicans. So they're just getting way outraised. Yeah, they're they, they are losing the money race hard. And we've talked before about kind of our ideas about money in politics, whether they determine winners or whether they follow winners. This to me seems like a strong vote in favor of following winners. Yeah. Because if you're seeing what's happening in this Congress and you want your money to be invested in a congressman who's more likely to be able to govern for you, I'm, I'm betting on Democrats. Right. Cause you can't, dude, you can't even probably buy a Republican just for the only reason that they can't pass anything anyway. Exactly. So there's no reason to do that unless you're, you're just stopping out. Democrat stuff. Yeah. But now, this is also crazy because Kevin McCarthy, like you said, man, there are, he raised a lot of money in California because he's from a rich area in California. And he was did a lot of work in the swing districts of California to mm-hmm. raise these people a lot of money. We're talking California's third, second, 13th, 27th, 40th, 41st. 45th. Okay. The big one that I want to highlight here is 22nd. Um, Val- Valido. Okay. Valideo. That guy, he only won by like two points. There's another one on here. Duarte on the 13th. He won by 0.4%. Yeah. We're talking crazy small margins of victory. Um, Johnson has simply not been able to keep up the same fundraising numbers for these endangered candidates. I want to give you the breakdown of their quarter one through quarter three average mm. of 2023. So between uh, quarter one and quarter three, this is when uh, Kevin McCarthy was the Speaker of the House. And the average quarter, they were uh, Duarte in California 13 was pulling in uh, $574,000 a quarter, okay? Quarter four, when Mike Johnson becomes speaker, now that candidate is only bringing in $320,000. That is a 44% difference from when Kevin McCarthy was speaker. So Duarte in California 13 is bleeding cash Mm. because of Mike Johnson's inability to help them get the money they need. Yeah. To me, man, if this means that if Democrats fail to win some of these seats, not only in California, but just in, if they fail to flip the House 
it is an enormous failure yes. of their campaign strategy. Dude, if right? Democrats if they're winning the win money the race, if they they are they they should be winning the publicity race. So it's it's there. It seems to me to be their elections to lose. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. And if, if we look at like a couple of these polls for like Senate candidates, right? We're looking at like John Tester, right? Mm-hmm. John Tester. There's recently been a poll with him plus nine above Tim Sheehy. Wow. Yes. He's beaten Tim Sheehy Holy by nine cow. points. John Tester, Democrat from Montana. In the same poll, Trump's beating Biden by 30. It's the same people getting asked that question. So there's a good amount of people who hate Biden, but like Democrats. Hmm. But it's also Montana. So, just, But my point is, even yeah. if you go to Michigan, okay? Recent, recent poll out from Michigan today from Emerson College has Donald Trump plus two in Michigan, mm. has Elisa Slotkin... The one of the people running for Senate in Michigan up nine or up seven against a Republican opponent mm. in the Michigan Senate race. OK, so like a lot of these Democrats in the congressional races are just doing well. Yeah. And what this says about Biden, I don't know. That's not what this segment's about. Point is, congressional Democrats are doing OK, even when Biden or even when Trump is winning the top line number. Interesting. You know, very interesting. So I don't know uh, if, if Democrats can't pull off this House victory. They got to do a big soul search. Yeah. Yeah. Big soul. search. Totally. Yes. All right, that is all I got for Mike Johnson. Should we go international really quick? Um, let me do. You know what? Let me do one more congressional because okay. we have one more uh, conversation going on with Brian Fitzpatrick and Jared Golden from Maine. So this is about new U- a new Ukraine aid bill that I think will die even faster than the first one died. Wow. So Brian Fitzpatrick. Uh, wants to pass Ukraine aid very badly. He is a national security hawk Republican. He's in a hardcore swing district. Um, His district, I think, voted for Biden by like plus 10. So he's in a very vulnerable position. Mm. And so he worked with Jared Golden in Maine. Jared Golden is in a very vulnerable position because he is a Democrat from the second congressional district of Maine. This congressional district was won by Trump in 2016 and 2020. So he's in a very conservative district. So the point is, on Sunday, they urged House colleagues to back their pared down proposal for Ukraine aid and border security. So now Fitzpatrick is, again, trying to tie border security changes to Ukraine aid. Okay, that's his goal. Mm-hmm. This isn't going to pass for two reasons. It goes too far right on some things, and then it goes uh, not even close to the center enough on others, that it's not going to have any broad base of appeal here. So mm-hmm. um, hard right Freedom Caucus members are already saying that it doesn't do enough. Um, to capture the border stuff. It doesn't do enough. Okay. They say it doesn't include enough provisions from HR2 on the border deal. It's not enough. Okay. Um, but then it also, Democrats are like, hell no, because it reinstates the Remain in Mexico policy, which absolutely no Democrat is going to be able to support. The Remain in Mexico policy means you will claim asylum at a United States point of, point of entry or somewhere, and then you'll get sent back to the country where you came from. Uh, no, it's not even that. It's, you're, you, it's, you're, you're released in Mexico. into Mexico. Right. You're released into Mexico. Yeah. No Democrat's going to be on board. That's just not going to happen. The bill also calls for the detention and expulsion uh, to Mexico for people without a hearing or a review of migrants who arrive in the United States. So just getting rid of the hearing and review process, no Democrat's going to be cool with that. Yeah. It's just not, no one's going to fly with that. There's, there's no, there's nothing there for anybody. And then it also removes all humanitarian aid from the Palestinians in Gaza. <laughs> I know, that was my reaction when I read it, dude. That was my how reaction. Are you, how do you even that was my justify reaction. that? Well, because they it's, it's all going to be used. Uh, all the food that we give them is actually going to be turned into bombs to for Hamas right. to hit Israel. Of course. So that's what will happen. They'll they'll pack the bread really, really tight into like rocks and then throw it at the Israeli missiles that are coming down from the sky. <laughs> all those 200,000 pound bombs will have nothing compared to the pasta that we send over. I can't. I just can't imagine pitching that as a politician. <laughs> yeah, we're going we're gonna to stop giving aid to the people who are getting literally blown up daily. <laughs> That's insane It's to insane. Me. And the cruelty is the point. The cruelty is the point, okay? But anyway, so this bill's obviously going to die because every Democrat in the country just had the same reaction you did. Yeah. Every, every like-minded person okay who has some semblance of humanity of compassion of compassion anything all right any sense of empathy all right there no one's going to be okay with this and democrats are just absolutely frustrated that the bill even had to be written because the truth is they already had a bill representative rosa deloro um from connecticut said we've got a bill it's got bipartisan support in the senate it ought to be set up for a vote right now and you know what if it was put up for a vote it would pass 
overwhelmingly. True. And that's true. Yeah. All you'd have to do was get it. Now, it pisses me off that these Democrats can't get some Republicans to sign off on that discharge petition, man. That's pissing me off. So you put that on the Democrats? No, I put it on Republicans, but where is the good negotiator in the Congre- in the in the Democrat Congressional Caucus right now mm. that's able to get Fitzpatrick and Bacon or something or Buck, whatever his name yeah. is, or one of the other ones, I don't remember anymore, to get them over the line here? No, I agree. And honestly, your point that you just made on our last segment about differences in voter po- and polling yes. on Biden versus on the down ballot congressional candidates tells me that i mean that's going to be true on the republican party side too the the fact of the matter is like we look at these exit polls we look at these local elections and they they matter as far as what the what we can expect the country to do on democrats and republicans but they also just go to show that the candidate matters yeah right candidate matters. the candidate does matter and if these these congressional candidates, these congressional Republicans are, I think they are making a political mistake mm-hmm. by kind of eliminating their uniqueness as candidates and just blending into the party. Dude, you are absolutely right. Every Republican who won election in a Biden won district yeah. should be clamoring to sign on to the discharge petition. Yes. Right? Yes. They should be clamoring Because then that. you can you can campaign on that. Yes. You can campaign on that. You can run on that. That's how Lisa Murkowski did so well in Alaska, right? Yes. Lisa Murkowski, senator from Alaska, she ran uh, a campaign almost as an independent slash Democrat aligned because like she was just herself in the Senate. Yeah. And then she made that her voice. So she was able to capture a good amount of Republicans, good amount of independents and a good amount of Democrats yes. in order to win. Yeah. And so more Republicans need to be doing that. When mm-hmm. you see this absolute breaking of your party's allegiance, dive into that break, dude. Yeah. Embrace it. Right. It, yeah. it makes you a better politician. You'll get rewarded for it at the ballot box. Yes. Just be be a pragmatist, be a problem solver instead of a politician. Yes. People like that. People love that. Yeah. Let's go over to international. OK. OK. I'm really excited about this piece of news. Um, Sweden is finally joining NATO. This is huge. guys. So Hungary's parliament ratified Sweden's accession to the bloc just earlier this week. Hungary was the last holdout in NATO. So Sweden's membership is now confirmed. Joining will politically enable integration of weapon systems and greater sharing of transportation infrastructure like ports, airports, and railroads to better enable these allies to move equipment and troops around the Baltic. And that is just the very beginning of why Sweden's it, Sweden's membership in NATO is so important. Sweden is, Sweden is probably the best country that NATO could have gotten. I think they're almost, I don't think there's even a debate on that. Um, they have. They are not spending 2% of their GDP on defense, which was a big topic just last week or two weeks ago after Trump made a comment about it. Um, but it still has one of the most highly advanced military industrial complexes in the world. Its companies make extremely sophisticated equipment, and it plans to hit that 2% target by 2026. No shit. Yeah, so it's already wow. ramping up, okay? Wow. Um it also has high competence in tech, making it a great partner for combating cyber threats. One of the big things that's happening in Russia right now is they're fighting this war not just on the ground in Ukraine. They're fighting an influence battle in Western countries, in yeah. online and media spaces, and trying to reduce democratic widespread support for Ukraine to make it harder for these countries to go out and do it themselves. Yep. Sweden's technological capacity is going to make it great for countering that and then its air force is one of the largest in europe and will help reduce reliance on american air power to patrol the region see i didn't even know that yeah no sweden sweden is armed to the teeth its history is really interesting because it's been neutral for about 300 years it's been a huge core bedrock to its identity but now uh, that this is what Russia's invasion of Ukraine has done. It's so black and white, so bad guy, good guy. So Russia is destroying the world order that has brought unprecedented peace for the last almost 100 years that Sweden's like, OK, well, this is if there was ever a reason for us to get involved with a defense organization, with the defense treaty, it's this. Right. And now is the time. Um so these are all of the the technological kind of components that Sweden helps us with. The one other one that I will point out is its submarine capacity. So 
we, the U.S. and other allies in NATO have good submarine capacity, but specifically for deep water. Sweden, having placed most of its focus on the Baltic Sea for the entirety of its history, um, is actually kind of the most highly advanced country in shallow water submarine technology because wow. um, the Baltic is a shallow ocean. So it's going to be able to project power super well throughout the whole Baltic Sea because of these submarines. Plus, it's going to be able to deter attacks on infrastructure between NATO countries in the sea, like pipelines or cables. That is huge. Yes, because we've also already seen during the Ukraine war, one, that Nord Stream was broken um, early in the war in 2022. We don't know who did that. And then a cable between Finland and Poland was also cut at some point that goes through the Baltic. So being able to have this submarine capacity in the water, they're going to be huge in controlling the Baltic. People are, geographically, its positioning is is insane. The Baltic Sea with Finland and now Sweden yes. is is being called a NATO lake. I was literally about to say that. Yeah. I was about to say that. It's the NATO sea now. It is. It is. The only non-NATO country on it is Russia, and it's only it only touches the Baltic in a few places. One is Kaliningrad, which, if you don't know, it's this non-contiguous part of russia which is wedged between poland and i think it's lithuania is the next yep. country up there um and it's super heavily armed but and it's going to be the place that russia would want to launch into the baltic but sweden has the best geographic position specifically an island called gotland um, it's right in the center of the baltic sea mm. and it's going to make it super difficult if not impossible for russia to to launch any kind of naval operations from Kaliningrad without being initially, like immediately cut off. Plus, if they want to get into the air and fly around in the Baltic, Sweden's not going to allow that either. Oh, no. So positionally, this is just given, it's completely clamped down in the Baltic in favor of NATO, um, which is huge. Um, and Listen, I, Russia must be kicking themselves right now because they've made the biggest geopolitical mistake any country has made oh, yeah. in so many years. Like you how did you how did you turn Sweden so hard against you? Yeah. It's Sweden. We're talking about like one of the hallmark neutral countries, yeah. right? And now you've even gotten them to consider or well, not consider to arm themselves with a defense treaty yeah. against you. And not even hall, like they're a hallmark neutral country, but also they've been historically one of the best militarized powers in the world yeah. like sweden hundreds of years ago was on the verge of being able to take over europe and only was stopped by a coalition of every other country in the continent w quick side note that was the first war i ever got uh, i ever learned a lot about really it's actually the great northern war 1700 yeah that was the first war that i learned a shit ton about and yeah it, it took a lot to destroy sweden it took denmark poland and russia yeah. to take them down they're they're insane. Um, so they're going to be a great ally. And I I just want to the big picture here, right? The reason we're excited about this is not just because we're Americans and America is a part of NATO. It's because I truly believe this is a this is a massive step in a, assuring more peace, in deterring further aggression from Russia. Yeah. I think Russia is already on the doorstep of wanting to push their invasion from Ukraine into other countries, into other NATO countries. And I think Sweden's addition, their military power, is going to be a significant reason to make Russia second guess that move. Oh, yeah. And Russia has suggested... Russia Oh my God! Putin did an interview with Tucker Carlson a few a few weeks ago, and he mentioned in the interview directly that the reason for Hitler's invasion of Poland was justified because of Polish aggression. That's insane. It, that's like that's just in that that is Nazi talking points. Yeah. Well, he didn't even say Polish aggression. He said Germany wanted some of Poland's land, and Poland didn't willingly give it up. Now, like, does that? not sound exactly like what just happened in Ukraine? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, he ran the same playbook in the same in a lot of ways to, to justify his invasion. Yeah. So, yeah. So this is big. This is important. It's important. And it's, it's also important that Hungary was able to finally get out of the way. 
Yeah. Right. Hungary has been the, the, the thorn in the side of the EU for a long time now. Yeah. Right. They, they've been having democratic backsliding. We've been concerned about that. Viktor Orban has been not a good partner in dealing with Ukraine and, and dealing with Russia. He's super buddy buddy with Putin. Yeah. So we were worried about this. But finally, it seems like all of his blustering is just that blustering. Yeah. Well, honestly, I think I think he got some kind of deal. I yeah. think some kind of bribe went through, mm. um, which as long as it's not to I mean, I don't expect it to have been that bad because right. Hungary's hungry. What's the worst thing that could have happened? Yeah. Um, so I guess I'm kind of glad that it did I'm happen. just glad it happened, man. Now we got Finland with a massive army right on Russia's borders. Yeah. Sweden with this crazy air force and these submarines. I yeah. mean, it's just, <laughs> God, Russia must be so mad at themselves for doing what they did. Yeah, they're Bunch of idiots. definitely not happy. Now, I, let's actually stick on Russia because I got a Russian story near the end of our page here. Yeah. Um, and it's all about the Russian sanctions. And it's talking about the Russian economy and the effects of our sanctions in the West and kind of how they're getting around them. And then still. Still getting around them very effectively and how they've changed their entire economy to deal with the Western sanctions. So mm. Russia has completely altered its international trade relationships completely um, due to the lack of we or the, the rescindance of Western demand. The main one? Russia has jumped right into China's arms. Trade with China has hit a record of $240 billion last year. I want to put that in perspective. In 2022, that number was around 10 to 15 billion. 10, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. 100 billion to 150 billion. Now okay. it's up to 200, around 250 billion. So you're looking at almost doubling in one year. We're looking at an almost <laughs> doubling in their export That's or crazy. their trade relationship in one year. Yeah. Russia uh, sells its oil that it used to sell to Germany and France over to China now. So I remember early on in the war, we were actually talking about like, okay, well, is Russia going to be able to dump all their oil onto the Chinese market? Will China be able to have that much demand? And it seems like they do, but not just China. They are also increasing their exports of petroleum to India. Yeah. The India exports to India have increased over 1.4 million barrels a day since the invasion of Ukraine. In perspective, before the invasion, they only exported 100,000 barrels per day. Mm. Now they're up to 1.5 million per day. This is uh, uh, India has been Russia's bankroller in a lot of ways by buying their petroleum products. Yeah, I mean in for India and for China, I will say this makes sense because obviously prices for Russian oil dropped precipitously after its invasion, after all of its Western customers stopped wanting to buy from it. Yeah. So they're just being like cheap energy. Cheap like, energy. I'll take it. Duh. Now, not just so now that's the petroleum sector, right? But also the financial sector. Um, Russia is now doing a lot of their export trading with the yuan, the yuan instead of the dollar. Yeah. Right. They're totally off the dollar. They're using the yuan for like is it, everything. Is it the yen? The yen. Uh, you want, I know it's yuan. spelled Yuan, but I think it's oh, pronounced it Yen. Be, I don't know. I'll say Yen. Now, the Yen is taking over basically all their exports, right? And it's not just their exports. Households in Russia are now stashing their savings in Yen. They're stashing their savings in Chinese currency. Companies are even borrowing off of the Yen. They're taking out loans in the Yen. Yeah. They are totally using that currency. Now, we can see in 2020... It was almost like 0% of the of the Russian economy was using the yen. In 2023, we're up to around 40%, 35% of the Russian economy using the yen. Yeah, it, They've totally jumped right into China's arms. And it's working out very well for China, and it's working out really well for Russia. Do you do you think... That this is good for China? Um, I mean, I'm sure it's good for China. Okay. It's just more investment in China. Yeah. Right? I'm, But I'm wondering, first of all, what could the West have done about this? I don't know. I think we're... I think nothing. Right. Like, I think, I mean, they, we've been cracking down in like at a more and more extreme magnitude every time a report comes out about how the sanctions aren't good enough. Mm -hmm. um, the fact that they are going to the yen is somewhat proof that they are being locked out of the Western financial order. Yes. The Western financial sanctions have been very effective. Yes. Yeah, the financial ones have been effective. There's no doubt about it. Yes. Whether just, or not they can just use other financial services and other financial tools, that's a different story. Yeah. But the Western ones, they've been blocked out of. Yes. And so I do think this is good for China, but also there is, God, I'm not, I'm not solid enough on finance and okay. like understanding currencies, but I do, I've read some of the fact that China's yen is not a... It's not a super stable yes. or strong currency. Yes. So Russia's risk 
has definitely gone up and by having China to do this. has interest in devaluing their currency in a lot of ways to keep their foreign ma- to keep their exports cheaper yes. than like domestic goods right yes. so one of the ways China is able to dominate US markets and other western markets so effectively is because they devalue their currency which makes it cheaper for american companies to then go in and buy chinese goods instead of buying domestically produced U.S. goods. Mm -hmm. So if now a lot of Russian people, households, uh, companies start using the yen for their regular financial transactions, that increases the power of the yen, which then makes their exports more expensive in the long term because demand for the yen goes up. Yes, but of course, they they will still order their state-owned banks to manipulate the currency so it won't matter and this is where like i just feel like i can't really say much more but i want to i want to go one more thing on that right if you're saying that the chinese banks would see this like right rise in value of their currency as a possible threat if they devalue that currency that's terrible for russian people who are saving in the yen right but Mm. it's very very good for russian companies who take loans out based off the yen okay it's very good for russian companies who take who take um, money out uh, or yeah. take loans on the yen yeah. it's the Russian people who start saving in yen that are going to get hurt from this that makes sense yeah which I'm sure Russia is fine with yeah I guess they're yeah they don't care yeah no. um, the other way that I think is the biggest issue that the West can and should do something about is that Russia is using its ex-satellite states to get around the Western sanctions we've talked about this before mm-hmm. but this data makes it perfectly clear um, even not only okay not only is it like regular manufactured goods that are getting into Russia we're talking about possible military materials making its way into Russia through countries like Armenia. And I want to focus on Armenia. This is a really staunch Russian ally. They've been a staunch Russian ally since like the 1700s. Mm. They've always been allies with Armenia. Uh, Armenia. Russia has viewed themselves as the protector of Armenia from the Turks and the Muslims that are around them. Okay, because Armenia is a Christian nation. So what am, what am I saying here? Since the invasion of Ukraine, Western exports to Armenia have almost tripled in size. And then as we see that tripling in exports to Armenia, the Armenian exports to Russia have quadrupled or tripled themselves. So yeah, something tells me Armenia hasn't been producing that many amazing things that Russia wants to buy. Something tells me yeah. it might have something to do with the fact that these um, these Western goods are getting into Armenia and then going straight into Russia. Yeah, somehow I don't think it's domestic consumption has just like tripled over the course of a year yeah. to get them there. So here we go, guys. We need to do something about Armenia and ex-satellite states. I'm not anti-Armenia in any way. If we go down to the Azerbaijan versus Armenia um, geopolitical struggle, I lean on the Armenia side. But we got to do something about this because this is ridiculous. Armenia, what is the purpose of having the sanctions if possible military equipment is going to be getting into Russia? I think, okay, we we can. I'm sure they are. They are trying. I'm sure. I do know like the U.S. is is has been ramping up these sanctions by placing by, by de-incentivizing companies specifically yes. from That's dealing right. with Russian agents or Russian um, military organizations. But what I'm wondering is, I, I, I'm expecting that the increased friction from the sanctions is still having an effect. Yeah, It's just not perfect. Right. right? It's increased friction, but it's not a complete stopgap. Yeah, it's not, I'm not saying that the sanctions have done nothing. That's that's not true. No. What I am saying is that the sanctions aren't tight enough. No. And if semiconductors are slipping through this and semiconductors are making their way through Armenia into Russia, we got to do something to stop that ASAP. That is not acceptable. Yeah. Because one of the good things about the Ukraine war, if there's any good things to be taken out of this, is the fact that Russia won't have the capacity to replace a lot of their higher end military equipment. Yeah. Right. The one thing that is now just I'm remembering on Friday, which was five days ago or four days ago, and was the second anniversary of the Russian invasion, mm-hmm. it, the U.S. did slap additional sanctions did. on Russia in concert with other Western countries because of the two-year anniversary as well as the killing of Alexei Navalny. Um, so maybe in a few months we'll be able to come back to this and see that there has been a real change because the reporting that I read said that those are pretty serious, pretty strict. Yeah. Um, but we're going to have to wait to find out. We have to wait and see. Yeah. The one other thing I'll mention on this and news that came out is that Russia's economy grew like pretty substantially last year. It's like 2.6%. 2.6% GDP. It's almost in t- it is a pure military economy now. Yes, yes. It is projected that they or it is estimated that they spent about 10% 
of GDP on their military industrial complex, which does fuel their economy, but also does put them in massive amounts of debt and means that as soon as this war is over, Russia's economy will collapse. Yeah, I mean, it's not stable to build, build an economy based off of war unless no. he's trying to go to war with NATO, which I hope he's not. No, but, which he is. I mean, but even that, I don't think it's, it's not permanently sustainable. No, I mean, no, he'll, obviously. Because Russia will get destroyed in a ground war with NATO, mm-hmm. and then it will have nothing. Yeah. Right? So Yeah, building an economy based off bullets is not a good way to go. Yeah. Now I want to go into a report that came out on the Inflation Reduction Act and basically how good has it been for climate change since it was passed. So this comes from a uh, an organization, I think they're called the Climate Monitor or something like that. This group of scientists, of researchers, put out projections for um, what the Inflation Reduction Act would mean for electric vehicles and what it would mean for clean energy electricity generation after the bill was passed in 2022. Now, after one and a half years, they looked back at the actual data, how many electric cars have, cars have been sold, how much new capacity has been installed, and they tested it against their initial projections to see if they're up to par. The results are mixed, okay? So the gist is that we're on track with solar, batteries, and EVs, but we're behind on wind power. So let's start with EVs, okay? okay. Sales of 1.43 million zero emissions vehicles constituted 9.2% of all light vehicle sales in 2023. That's way better than 2022. Yes. Yes. In 2022, it was about 6.5%. So in this 9.2 was at the top end of the post IRA projected range that these researchers okay. put in. Okay. But it's also about three times the amount projected in 2020 before the IRA was passed. Gotcha. So, like, clearly the IRA has had a huge effect on the growth rate of electric vehicles taking over the market. Yeah. Now, growth is expected to fall in 2024 because there are going to be some headwinds on pricing. Um, as Tesla has Tesla's forward guidance says that they don't expect blockbuster in 2024, but that the growth rate could be even higher in 2025 and onwards. But even though the growth is expected to fall in 24, it's not expected to fall below levels that earlier projections had it. Yeah, I mean, like the main thing, the main reason a lot of these industries are falling, <clears throat> right, or, or consumption and, and demand for these industries is falling is because of high interest rates. These are very, very impacted. Demand for these products whether it be solar, whether it be, you know, your EV, whether it be utility, um, renewable generation, all that is very, very contingent on the cost of borrowing. Yes. So when I'm cost not sure. of borrowing is high, it's going to it's gonna slow demand on these types I'm of I'm not sure it's demand, but it's price. So it's, okay. it drives up the cost of building them, obviously, and that drives up the price. Oh, sure, sure, sure. Yeah. 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 Just to, be, to yeah, yeah. be clear. So that's where we're at on EVs. We're kind of, we're up to par. Then in terms of producing electricity... Right. In 2023, 32.3 gigawatts of renewable energy production and storage capacity were added. 18.4 gigawatts of that was solar. So we're killing it with solar. Okay. 6.4 gigawatts for batteries, which is also far above what the projections were at the beginning. 6.3 gigawatts for wind. Okay. That's depressing. It is depressing. So solar is expanding rapidly. Batteries kind of work really well with solar because you have these very typical cycles with solar, right? All the sun during the day and then at night you don't have any, but people come home from work at night and there's an electricity usage spike right. that happens when they get home. Batteries are huge for carrying over that solar that was generated during the day through that evening spike. Right. Okay. But while solar is expanding, batteries are expanding, wind is at, wind is down in absolute terms since 2021. We installed much more wind in 2021 than in 2022, than in 2023. Damn. Okay. And wind is also likely to miss the capacity it needs to hit to get back on track by 2024. So this is not, this is not good news. This is bad news in our transition. So the question is why, right? Why is wind doing worse than the projections set? There are two takes here that I've, that I've heard and that I like. Okay. One is based just on physics. So the best geographies for onshore wind are these low, flat areas like the Great Plains in the Midwest, for instance. But these tend to be far from the large population centers. Obviously, we have Chicago in the Midwest, but otherwise, most of our populations live on the coasts. Right, right, right. right? So 
when you have when you're generating the electricity that far from the population centers what you need is a ton of transmission and we don't have a ton of transmission right so we need to be able to build out this infrastructure to be able to actually get the wind power to the people who want to use it yeah that's interesting i know in texas they're seeing a lot of success with the wind power right because texas is but, that, but those wind farms that are being built in those plains are way close to population centers yes texas is kind of like the one texas is an example of the easy place yeah to build the wind or like you can build them in oklahoma and then transfer mm-hmm. to texas um but across the most of the midwest right. you're not close to anything right. and so this is like they've been a, the ira has effectively reduced the costs of wind to make it more than competitive with fossil fuel energy generation but if the infrastructure isn't there to make it possible right. it's still not going to happen mm-hmm. so now in my opinion the like there's going to be an ira 2.0 that comes out at some point if the democrats win the senate and the house and or, keep the president yeah or keep the presidency at least yeah um it needs to focus very specifically on transmission on funding transmission build out and on permitting reform to make sure that can happen extremely quickly the other take that i want to talk about is in regards to supply chains so solar manufacturing as we've talked about many times completely dominated by china on the other hand manufacturing for wind turbines is still largely done in the west and that's the case because we can get these solar components from china really cheaply because it's easy to ship them but with wind power we're using such enormous parts that it actually is a big deal to try to ship wind turbine parts overseas and get them to build here that's one of those things like you're like thinking about oh shipping something is difficult because of the size it's like you don't really think about that anymore no really i feel like i don't know my interpretation of like solutions to modern problems is like i don't know get a bigger boat i don't even no exactly everything can get everywhere easily but but these are actually big enough that that's things you take for granted yeah yeah totally so it makes sense so they're built near where they're actually installed for that reason um and so when COVID hit china kept its manufacturing going pretty much all like completely ramped up china's worried about people getting too idle and lose and creating social instability because they're not doing anything Mm -hmm. so they have already been they've been all in on manufacturing they've been all in on exports for as long as we can remember right like since basically since they've been a modern economy so they never slowed down their production of solar parts but the west did very much slow down and and um, temporarily pause their production of wind parts. And so wind has never gotten completely back online. That's why wind now building it out is harder and it's more, it's somewhat more expensive than it otherwise would be. Mm. Um, that's something fortunately that should just dissipate with time, I think. But okay. I think the the transmission issue is going to be a really big deal and this wasn't even including offshore wind we talked about we've talked about offshore wind on the show and how it's been hurt really badly by rising interest rates um but there are other things that are holding off offshore wind it's the reason we're not really talking about it now is these early projections didn't even expect to build out of offshore wind no way really so it doesn't really hurt at least not by this point mm-hmm. so it doesn't actually take us down on our expectations. Do you think we, we know have. if offshore wind was added to our onshore wind numbers from this report that it would equal the projection? Do we know that or no? It, the, these projections still do include offshore wind. Oh, they do? Yeah. Oh, okay. So that doesn't really help. It just okay. so little was built um, this year that it doesn't really move the needle. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And 2024, I don't expect much more to be built either. No. I mean, we can be hopeful if... Eh, no, in 2024, because what we need is interest rate cuts. Right to then create a downstream yeah. bigger build out. So and like we might get a cut in March, but maybe yeah. Maybe end of March or they need to if if the CPI report on March 15th is good, mm-hmm. but you know, then we'll see. If the inflation rate if the if our interest rates start getting cut in early March, maybe it's possible it gets better. And even then the cuts are going to be relatively small. We yeah. need multiple cuts, which we will get eventually, I think. Yeah. Um some experts are saying that it could be three cuts in 2024, yeah. which would be good for everybody. Yes. Um, you know, especially since like it's not a scenario where like our economy could go into recession if we don't get a rate cut, but like we're definitely missing out on multiple economic multipliers if we don't. Yeah, totally. Now, yeah, no, you know? I mean, right, right now is the 
biggest the i mean especially in terms of climate change we need these rate cuts the one other thing i will say about offshore wind even though it's not really specific to this Mm -hmm. current event um it has been stalled for other supply chain reasons because offshore wind needs these extremely unique specialized vessels to build it right well because you have to you have to take all the wind stuff off and you have to kind of build these little undersea platforms to be able to build the yes. um the turbine oh, right. and there's a limited number of those ships even available extremely limited and there's also a law on the books in the u.s called the jones act yes that prevents you from using internationally like crude and uh assigned like i i don't know shipping well enough i don't know the terms i know but, but it definitely needs a u.s crew it needs a U.S. crew and it needs to be like a U.S. built ship Yeah, is the thing. And so the U.S. U.S. companies haven't been in the business of building one of these specialized offshore wind vessels, mm-hmm. right? Which means it's they have to go, they have to use these workaround processes to be able to use the few international vessels that do exist for it. Yeah. So repeal the Jones Act. That's just a little side yeah, tangent. Repeal but, the Jones Act. Um, yeah, that's that's where we're at via oh, the IRA. We can keep talking about the IRA, actually. Cool. Because another portion of the IRA was the expansion of the IRS. Yes. The IRA added a lot more funding to the IRS. I think it was around $60 billion over a 10-year time span. I thought it was 80. 80. It might be 60. I, I, you know why I might heard the 60? might be down to 60 now. Yeah. yeah. The So 80 to $60 billion of IRS funding going, uh, going into the IRS, going after the tax police, specifically... For the goal of revamping their ability to audit high income earners. So high earners. So throughout the history of the IRS, they have been, especially over the last two decades, they've been unable to go after the richest people in the country for tax evasion, specifically because it's just harder to do it. It's way easier to hire low skilled um, people into the IRS and then go after people who wrongfully claim the earned income tax credit and hurt the most vulnerable people in our community than it is to fully fund the IRS, hire more sophisticated uh, and analysts, and then go after the millionaires and billionaires who cheat the tax system. Yeah. But now, for the first time in a long time, the IRS is given the teeth to actually fight back. So the nation's millionaires and billionaires are evading more than $150 billion a year in taxes. That is from the IRS projection estimate. So $150 billion a year is being evaded. And that's what the IRS needs to start getting and cutting into. What are you thinking about? I'm just thinking that's like, what, that's like 3% um, of our of our government revenue on average? No, no, no. So $150 billion a year, that would be the equivalent of 20% of our military budget. Of our military budget, but that's not our government revenue. Our government re- revenue, also, I think I think it's less than twenty percent. No, one hundred fifty times five is seven fifty. We we just spent like eight eighty. You're right. You're so right. so it's like it's like fifteen. Yeah. Um, uh, I'm gonna look up this number. The just government to, revenue. It's yeah. definitely over one trillion dollars, though. It's definitely. It's not one. It's not. No, I know. Okay, that's why I said it. One hundred fifty is like three percent. Oh, I thought you said thirty. No, I was no, no. like, what? okay, in 2023, the federal government collected 4.44 trillion. So 1.15 over 4.44. Yeah, 3%. <laughs> You're fucking crazy. Let's that's go. That's crazy. That's nuts. Okay, that's insane. <laughs> so we're losing out on 3% of our overall government revenue. Which doesn't sound a lot, but is that's a, a lot. lot of money. <laughs> that is so much. Yeah. That is so much. Yeah. So, um, Audits of taxpayers making more than $1 million a year fell by more than 80% over the last decade. This is because the IRS wasn't getting the funding that it needed. Well, the IRS is already stacking up a lot of successes on this front. The agency identified 1,600 millionaire taxpayers who have failed to pay at least $250,000 each in assessed taxes. So this means that the IRS has collected more than $480 million from this group of only 1,600 individuals, and they're only going to keep going. That's so few. I know. It's so few, and they're able to get 480 million bucks out of them. Yeah. I'm so interested in- All from evaded taxes, not even from raising them. Yeah. And of course, a big part of this funding has gone to just hiring more qualified Mm -hmm. IRS agents, but I'm also really curious what- role is technology well that's ai a, playing i'm in so this, glad right? you said that because the, the the director actually specifically mentioned ai yeah as one of the reasons that they're able to capture 
these types of improper transactions and then use AI to understand different, you know, tax patterns, right? That's And then go after those people based around that. Yeah. But they needed the money to develop those AI mechanics. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So that, it's awesome. Now, what is the IRS doing? The IRS is bringing the hammer down on the ultra wealthy when they abuse tax breaks for corporate jets. This is the one thing Mm. that they're going after specifically in this tax season. They're going to go after hardcore. So, um, there are about 50 audits that are taking place this spring, and they're going to target people who use private jets and then write them off for business purposes. They are starting off by going after the corporations themselves, but the IRS Commissioner Danny Werfel has indicated that they're prepared to go after the individuals if they need to. So they're going to go really hard at these people who are abusing the private jet write-offs. So the agency has developed a database of corporate jet activity, and this will help them identify where they should audit. This is a good example of them implementing new technological solutions to help them keep track of stuff like this. The fact that they don't have this database yet says something. There's only so many individuals who are charting private jet for business purposes, right? And we don't even have a database of them yet to make sure that they're paying their taxes right. Now it's going to change. Mm-hmm. So the Treasury Department said last week it estimates greater IRS enforcement will, will result in an additional $561 billion in tax revenue over the 10-year time frame. So just to make everyone aware, we spent $80 billion to fund the IRS, and we're expecting to make back $560 billion. It's just a good investment. Just a good investment. Yeah. pays for itself. Totally. Cool. Awesome. What is next? I think I have natural gas. I think that's the last. Mm. Oh, and natural gas and then the big one. Okay. Mm. So now I want to talk about some uh, energy-related news. This goes really well off of the conversation we were having about the IRA and their transition over to renewables. There is a lot of volatility going on in the natural gas market right now. Adjusted for inflation, natural gas future uh futures prices have hit their lowest levels since 1990 Mm. Um, this is a total decimation of the market and these low costs have led to basic materials like steel concrete cardboard fertilizer um being very good uh having very low cost which is good for producers that use those input materials yeah that's very good for farmers it's good for u.s manufacturing it's awesome that those um those gas gas associated products are now cheaper to build more finished goods with. Consumers are also seeing some benefit from this. Um, Gas costs were 18% lower this January than they were last January. But there's an, there, there's an issue. Well, issue isn't the right word. Okay. But companies are going to be adjusting to this. Companies are preparing to limit their output to match the demand and raise prices. So 18% decrease is not sustainable. Mm-hmm. We see companies pulling back on their investment, right? They're already like not going to be able to, they're not going to produce as or invest as much in new natural gas production while these prices of natural gas are so low, Yeah, which is good for our fight against climate change. It definitely is. Yeah. yeah. Like we, because, because consumer behavior will change with prices rising and yes. thus it will incentivize further limiting of production, which means less is going to be burned unless it's going to be emitted. Yeah, so Chesapeake is one of the biggest uh, producers in the country. And they said it's going to cut its production by 20% in 2024. That's huge. Compared to last year. They're going to cut their production by a fifth. That's huge. We just need to make sure that our our replacements, our renewable are replacements, yeah, are, are in place. Natural gas is used widely, for example, in heating buildings. Yes. Um, well, then that's a really good thing. Because now okay, this, this is exactly where I'm going to next. Okay. So demand for gas has been unusually low this year, mm. and especially over the last two years. And why is that? Well, cities in the north region of the country, Minneapolis, Cleveland, they have experienced their mildest winter since 1950. So it's a really weird situation where climate change made the earth warmer. So now we have to burn less fossil fuels to heat our homes and buildings. That's really interesting because I've read other reports of slowing economic activity in January being because of an abnormally cold winter. And I wonder if that's in other parts of the country. It's probably on other parts of the country that don't rely on natural gas for their heat. Um. N- maybe well then yeah that's the only way it would be explainable maybe or just maybe just lower population centers where oh, otherwise yeah. like lower population centers but places where industrial build out mm-hmm. would happen right 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 maybe yeah um the big issue here is coming where is in relation to the storage of all this gas so all this gas isn't being consumed so it has to be stored somewhere 
And as of February 16th, storage facilities for natural gas are 22% more full than the five-year average at this time of the year. So (laughs) there is just a massive backlog of all of this uh, natural gas. Now, what is good is that the United States is selling some of this natural gas abroad, Mm. right? They're liquefying it, now selling it abroad. So that's good that these companies have another market to sell the gas over to, Yeah, right? I mean, I would hope they're selling it to India and China and thus that it can be replaced, it can replace coal. But sadly, it's not. It's (laughs) being sold to Europe, which also, if you're talking about Germany, might go and replace coal. Yes. Because they're clowns over there. Yeah. Well, they're they're, they're terrified of not having energy. Yeah. So now... What's crazy about this is people don't expect the prices to rise anytime soon. And what's my evidence for that? Well, put option sales for the right to sell gas at certain prices um, are having lower and lower strike prices. Now, what does this mean if you didn't take a, a finance class ever? So put options means you are buying the right to sell something at a lower cost later time. So you can say... I bet, you know, uh, your drum set is going to be worth $10 later, even Mm -hmm. if it's only worth $100, right? Even if it's worth $100 right now. So I'm going to give you $5 for the right to sell your drum set at $10 at a certain point if it reaches this or whatever. Yeah. Um, What's happening is people are buying put options for strike prices as low as 50 cents. Right now, wow. there are do- uh, 50 cents per million British thermal units. Right now, the natural gas costs $1.50 of British thermal units. So wow. a lot of investors are expecting the price to be a third of what it is today. And $1.50 is already massively historically low. Yeah, yeah. So the That's fact wild. that they're expect- some investors are expecting it to drop that much, it says a lot. Um, it says a lot also about like maybe these investors are seeing these put options um, or are buying these because they think maybe um, our transition to green energy is going to go better than a lot of people think. Maybe. I'm I'm hopeful of that. Yeah, that's what I'm hoping. That's be, hope. Yeah, because I, I don't – I guess my understanding isn't that the transition – for, for example, heating buildings, right? I know natural gas is also used for electricity generation, mm-hmm. but I didn't think the transition was going that fast. So I'm skeptical that this is a structural change that yeah. we're seeing. This is a response to rather than a temporary capitalization. Yeah, right? I think it's a temporary capitalization. We, yeah. just, we just have to see what happens from there. And if the, I know like Biden did something recently with selling natural gas abroad, right? Mm-hmm. He limited new permits. Yeah, he he paused approval of new permits for exports. Right. Yeah. So that only increases the backlog here of this natural gas at home. Right? True. True. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, so that that's what's going on in the natural gas market. Really interesting stuff. Mm-hmm. Cool. And I think we're on our last couple here. I think we're on our do last. Do you want to go to IVF or do you have you have one above about Israel settlement? Oh, we got to do Israel. Do that. Okay. We got to do the Israel one. So Israel is the largest thorn in Joe Biden's side and is the most tragic and devastating thing going on on the international stage right now. Um, What page is my Israel notes on? (laughs) Oh, there it is. Okay. So Biden this week finally reversed a Trump era policy uh, in which the U.S. federal government was supporting Israeli settlements in the West Bank. The fact that Biden hasn't reversed this policy yet speaks a lot to his stance on Israel. This should have happened three and a half years ago. It shouldn't have had to take everything that's happened now for him to reverse something that Trump did, even though that Trump policy was Trump. That Trump policy of supporting settlements in the West Bank was a rejection of 20 years of American international orthodoxy. Okay. And so the fact that I didn't know that. Yeah. The fact that Biden is only now reversing it, he's going back to a norm. It's not like some revolutionary thing. It's really disappointing because Israeli settlement in the West Bank is one of the most obvious, obvious. oppressor actions yeah. that is happening in the world, right? And it's directly opposed to movement towards a two-state solution, which Biden continually evangelizes. Yeah, and Netanyahu has specifically praised himself for saying how happy he is that he has continued to destroy the two-state solution future. Yeah. He has specifically said that he doesn't want two-state solution, Mm -hmm. that he should get credit for killing a two-state solution. And he also says that these settlements are the reason that we don't have a two-state solution. And that's why he supports them. Yes. So Anthony Blinken um, calls these new settlements inconsistent with international law, which I'm glad he said. Netanyahu is obviously not happy 
But again, this has been way too long in the making. Yes. This move comes after Biden put sanctions on four Israeli individuals who committed crimes against Palestinians in the West Bank. This is a good move. This is a revolutionary step. The U.S. has never sanctioned individuals for their actions against Palestinians, let alone settlers in the West Bank. Mm -hmm. So this is a really good move from the Biden administration. But yes. it's only four of them. All right. And it's not systemic. It's individual. Yeah. They're not going after like the, com the, the, the councils that run the towns that do bad things. They're going after the individual person that does a bad thing. That's not a systemic solution to any of this. It's a good move, but it's still kind of the smallest move he could have made. The absolute smallest move he could have made, right? Yeah. The Republican Jewish coalition actually backed Biden after his response to the October 7th attacks and his support for Israel. But now, with his reversing of this settlement policy and con condemnation of the Israeli settlements in the West Bank, they said that this is yet another low light to its campaign of undermining Israel. Yeah, and I think this is an important place to kind of look at Biden's campaign, looking at how this might affect the U.S. election, because right now, arguably the biggest problem that Biden's campaign has, maybe besides his age issue, mm -hmm. is that there is dissent internally in the Democratic Party because of how he's treated Israel, because of the support that he's given them after October 7th. And we've talked many times on this podcast, including doing a deep dive on why we also disagree with Biden's response to this. It's gone... It, Israel's actions have gone way too far. And the fact that Biden continues to fund them financially and to arm them and to support this response is not a good thing. But this quote, I think, from the Republican Jewish Coalition is a really good signal that not voting for Biden is not going to change anything about United States support for Israel. Yeah. If anything, I think Benjamin Netanyahu is hoping that Trump gets elected because his heavy support amongst white evangelicals aligns with supporting Israel, right? Absolutely. So he is more, he's more accountable to that part of the country that is aligned with Israel going in and attacking Palestine, attacking Gaza and Hamas. So to me, I understand the complaint with Biden. I understand being frustrated that you can't, that despite the internal dissent, it's not having that big of an effect mm -hmm. as far as his support to Israel. But the fact of the matter is Trump would not be any better. And if anything, he might even be worse. He would be not, he would be enormously worse. It would be enormously worse. Okay. And what, what is good about Biden being president on this issue is that he can be pushed to change course. Exactly. Trump could never be pushed. Yeah. If Trump was president, everything that he done would have stayed the same. The support for Israel never would waver. Israel would be able to do anything and everything, and Trump would be behind him. Yes. Biden would not. Biden would take pressure from the U.S. progressive base for fighting for Palestinian freedom, okay? Yeah. And this this is an example of it. Totally. And tr Trump, Trump alienated Muslim voters long, long ago. <laughs> long he, ago. So he has no concern about losing those people from his coalition. That's why Biden being in this position is actually better because he, he is at least he's leaking that he's frustrated with Israel's response. At least he's going out and putting sanctions on these four Israeli individuals who committed crimes against Palestinians in the West Bank, right? Yep, yep. He's doing something. There's no reason for us to have any expectation that Trump would push Israel at all. No, no, no. So, Trump, tr Trump would push them to fire a nuke at Gaza. That's what Trump would do. Okay? That's a little far. I mean, I'm just being hyperbolic. I know. But do they know? Probably not. Yeah. All That's right. the thing you get roasted for in the comments. I'm trying to protect you. Yeah, I know. My, my, my hyperbole is not very popular. Okay. <laughs> so all of this, all these changes to settlement policy is coming off of the back of a senior Israeli minister announcing a plan uh, that would move ahead with 3,000 new housing units in settlements in the West Bank. Mm. Now, most of these would be in uh, Malay Adu, Adumim. I, don't, I can't pronounce it right. But... This is very important because this is where three Palestinian gunmen actually killed one Israeli and wounded several others last Thursday. Mm. Okay, so this is in a direct response to a Palestinian attack on the Israeli settlement. Okay, so now this minister is calling the new units an appropriate Zionist response to the attack. 
Now, this is really important because this is telling you their philosophy about all the reasons that they're doing this. It's not for security, right? It's for punishment of the people who did the attack or whatever. And then it's for the expansion of the Jewish state period, okay. right? It's not just security concerns that they try to frame the settlements as. It's like, we need to have closer lines of defense in between. We can't let them have these pockets of control, but but it's not about that. It's not about that. It's about expanding the Jewish state. Yeah. Yeah. Period. Mm -hmm. So these settlements, these settlements are designed to make it absolutely impossible for a contiguous Palestinian state to be formed in the West Bank. So if you ever look at a map of the West Bank, I recommend you do and look at a map of where the Israeli settlements are in the West Bank. And you'll see they're like snaked around. It looks almost like a checkerboard. Okay. And the reason that they're doing that is because they're trying to make it impossible for international arbiters and peacemakers to draw a map that includes all Palestinian people and all Jewish people into their own separate states. They're trying to do that on purpose yep. so that they make it impossible for a Palestinian state to ever be drawn or made. Now, 500,000 Israelis now live among the 2.7 million Palestinians in the West Bank. This is going to make it harder and harder for the Palestinians to ever, ever have a state, in, even though Israel would never really let them have it anyway. Yeah. I like, mean, this is just confirmation that Israel has no intention yeah. of letting them. A total of 12,349 housing units and settlements advanced through various stages of the bureaucratic planning process in 2023. This is a tripling of what was done the previous year. The settlements are ramping up, and they're ramping up fast. These numbers are coming from the Israeli organization Peace Now, who does not agree with anything Netanyahu is doing. Yeah. So th the settlements are expanding. This is a complete destruction of the Palestinians' hope for a state. Joe Biden comes out, and he says he wants a two-state solution. Joe Biden. Do something. Do something. Yeah. Do something. You are in a position to do something. All, what you need to do is condition all aid to Israel going forward on the stopping of expansion in the West Bank. Yes. Okay. And, I mean, and a ceasefire. And a ceasefire. Obviously. Well, th well, then this leads to another thing. He's at an ice cream shop the other day, licking his cone, and uh, a reporter asks him about a ceasefire. And he's like, there should be one by next Monday. Just casually. Is that true? Mm. Like, what the? What's going on behind the scenes if he's just saying, that, yeah, by next Monday, there should be a ceasefire, which makes me really hopeful because that means that the Israeli planned operation in Rafa might not be happening. Maybe. Yes, maybe. I mean, Biden has continuously said that it's it's just about the hostages. Right. right. It's just, it's about, just about making sure that the hostages can all get out and they need to have an agreement with that in writing to make sure that it actually happens and that a ceasefire can go through. Yes. So we can be hopeful. Um, did you see Biden went on to Seth Meyers? I did last see that. Night? Yeah. Um, I think I think he's hearing the you're not getting out enough. Um, you're not doing enough to show voters that yeah. you're good to run. He didn't um, seem that old to me in that interview. He seemed like kind of old, but but he seemed like charming, but like clearly with it. Yes, he right? seemed like he's with it. not gone. No, at he's all. not like a dementia ridden freak. That's not what's happening. No, and he gave he gave an uh, I think a very cogent answer on. Um, on what is happening in Gaza? Because Seth Meyers, yeah, yeah, I didn't read, I didn't see that. Part. Um, yeah, he he basically said that yes, there there is a path forward. It is two states, but right now we have to focus on getting the hostages before we can get to a ceasefire and think about that two state solution. Um, I'm still skeptical. I'm still worried because Netanyahu continues to put out. He just put out some of his most detailed plans about what would happen in Gaza after the war, which includes Israel having complete military control of the enclave um so I, I don't biden doesn't seem willing enough to actually pull the strings no uh, listen here he made this he made the statement that he's no longer in lo lockstep with netanyahu yeah good that's great now you need to push back against him you exactly. don't just have to not be in lockstep you have to like push him over yeah right? you need to do something to change his course immediately the problem is we're almost five months in yeah right and so when you're when you're thinking about this as a negotiation you should have been putting conditions and deadlines All the on their through. behavior that is that have been passing much quicker than this mm -hmm. um and i don't know i i think i understand because once you're doing that you're no longer allies right right your your partners mm -hmm. But it's different, mm -hmm. right? And I think Biden is just, he's extremely reluctant to break the alliance between the two countries. I absolutely agree with you. Yeah. I absolutely agree. And now tonight in Michigan, because it's Tuesday, this is the, the Michigan primaries going on tonight. 
there's a movement in Michigan right now to vote uncommitted in the Democratic primary for president instead of voting for Joe Biden. Super interested to see what happens there. Yeah, right? we'll see. We'll see how many votes come out for the uncommitted. I My guess, 15 percent uncommitted. OK, that's a, that's a high ball, too. But I think it'll be like 15 that's that's a lot that's a lot dude that's worrisome to me because i think i think that's a good sign of like how how much does biden have to worry about this coming to the general but if he gets a ceasefire by next monday does all those uncommitted then like sing his praises clap their hands and vote for him happily i i don't think so i i mean i think there's gray area here Mm -hmm. right he'll win some of them if he actually is able to make any steps towards a two-state solution happen yeah he'll get more of them but some he's lost Uh, some he's lost forever yeah Yeah, somebody's lost forever. Yeah, so we'll see. Now let's get back to the biggest story in in domestic U.S. politics. I think that's relevant for the election. This Mm -hmm. is this is a really big deal. Republicans have endangered access to IVF treatment in the state of Alabama. So the Alabama Supreme Court has recently ruled that frozen embryos are children. Now, how did this all come about? Why is the Supreme Court even making these decisions? Where did this happen? What is going on here? Mm. Well, the Alabama Supreme Court um, said three Alabama couples who lost frozen embryos during an accident at a storage facility said that they could sue the fertility clinic and hospital for the wrongful death of a minor child. So they're saying that, like, I think they went into the room. They touched the, this is what I think was going on. They touched the, they touched the containers where the embryos were being stored. They were very cold. They dropped them. And when they dropped them, they shattered, they broke the embryos, right? So now they're saying that that was tantamount to manslaughter, right? Wrongful death of a minor child. So the court fell short of granting embryos all constitutional rights. So they're not saying that the, that, that this that an embryo has all the constitutional rights and the rights that are given to them within like the 14th amendment of like equal protection clause or anything like that yeah they didn't go that far but they went far enough and we'll get into the repercussions of this in the decision the court actually directly cited the bible so it they said that this is a quote it is as if so okay let me let me rewind recently the people of alabama voted in a amendment to the constitution that is called the sanctity of unborn life. Mm. So this amendment was all kind of around abortion. So then they say this, okay? This is a quote from the decision. It is as if the people of Alabama took what was spoken of the prophet Jeremiah and applied it to every unborn person in this state. But this is a quote from the Bible. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. Jeremiah 1.5. So this is saying that the Alabamans put in their constitution, they're saying that the Alabamans put Bible language in their constitution by passing the Sanctity of Unborn Life Amendment. So mm. that's what they're suggesting here. So they're saying they're okay. quoting the Bible in these decisions. Apparently, this Chief Justice quotes the Bible all the time. It's okay. not new to him. Mm. He quotes the Bible all the time. It's absolutely ridiculous and ludicrous. I'm sure Alabamans like it. I bet they love it. That's yeah. why he's in that position. Yeah. Right? That's why mm-hmm. he's there. Mm-hmm. He wouldn't be there if they if the Alabamans didn't like it and, you know, want that type of Christian nationalism involved in their government. Mm-hmm. And now in response to this, three IVF facilities have indicated that they will stop all treatment in the state in response to this. Um, we This is a quote from one of their leaders. We are saddened that this will impact our patients' attempts to have a baby through IVF, but we must evaluate the potential that our patients and our physicians could be prosecuted criminally or face punitive damages for following the standards of care for IVF treatment. This is exactly the same stuff that happens when abortions get regulated to the point that doctors get scared that if they perform an abortion, they're going to lose their license or go to jail. And what happens is the performance of abortions go through the floor, and now no one has access to the health care that they need or deserve. Yeah, IVF should not be something that gets regulated like this. It's insane to say that an embryo is the same thing as a born child. Yes, it is. It is insane. I mean, by that logic, IUDs are should be illegal because they, yeah. An IUD functions by not allowing a fertilized egg to attach to the uterine line. So it's an embryo that's existing that's trying to attach to the uterine line, and then the IUD stops it from being able to attach itself to the uterus, and so it falls out. Okay. That's killing an embryo. I see. 
and that's exactly where they're going with, with you. This. Yeah, that's yeah. that's where this is. Like, the, <laughs> birth control is not allowed. Is where they're right. Going they're with going this. with birth control is not allowed. Whew. Yes. So there's awful testimony from parents who have said that you know they were excited to go through IVF treatment, and these IVF facilities have called them and tell them that they can't do it anymore. Mm. And like what was supposed to be the best day of their life is now like one they're going to remember forever is the day that they don't get to you know be with their kid yeah um and it's important because why is this why is this impacting ivf so much well the ivf procedure fertilizes like five embryos at a time Mm. because it's a very expensive procedure to do and the success rate isn't that high so what happens is you normally do five you may get two you do or you do like 10 and you like save three for later so like you can have multiple kids down the line yeah right um and i think one it's a massive percent of Americans that go through IVF treatment, okay? Um, and now we're in this position where IVF is threatened in Alabama. The attorney general of Alabama is has said that he's not going to prosecute anybody for this, but that doesn't mean that individuals can't prosecute IVF providers for this the yeah. same way these people have. Exactly. It's too risky. Just like we've talked about with abortion restrictions, it prevents doctors from wanting to do abortions, even if they're supposed to be within the exemptions of these laws, yep. you're going to have the same problem with IVF, where it's just not worth it for these um, for these IVF facilities to actually go through with the surrogacies. Oh, absolutely. And so now this isn't just a problem for Alabama Republicans. This is a problem for national Republicans, too. This is so interesting to me. Yeah. This yeah, is how they responded. This is the, the response here is telling. So national Republicans are struggling with the Alabama IVF decision. Multiple national Republican leaders have come out and say that they don't agree with anything that would put IVF in danger. That's their language, though. They don't say they don't agree with the decision. They don't say they don't agree that embryos aren't humans. Right. They say they don't agree with anything. That would put IVF access in danger. Mm. They're not attacking the fundamental thing that put IVF in danger. Sure. So Mr. Johnson, St. Louis Republican, has made clear his position. You said St. Louis. Louisiana Republican. Louisiana Republican uh, has made clear his position as a pro-life Christian. And he has has joined with President Trump and a slew of other Republicans that that IVF treatment is good to go. Totally fine. Yes. Well, what Trump said in his truth social post Mm -hmm. is... We need to do we we need to have more babies, not fewer, right? And so that's kind of their bottom line here. Okay, I mean, does that make no, sense? No, to you? no. Listen, it makes sense to me, yeah. but it shouldn't make sense to every pro-life conservative out there, because haven't they been saying forever that life begins at conception? Mm-hmm. If life begins at conception, that is your line. Own it. Now that a court has finally makes the determination that you've been asking for for decades, they finally tell you, you're right, life does begin at conception. They're like, oh shit, no it doesn't. Life doesn't begin at conception. That's crazy. It, it would be way too crazy. We wouldn't be able to have enough kids. People who want kids wouldn't be able to have them. Yeah. We need more babies. Just kidding. Life doesn't begin at conception, guys. I'm just kidding. Embryos aren't people. That would be absolutely ridiculous. They've been saying it for decades. And now the second the dog finally catches the car, they have no idea what to do with it. And they freak the fuck out. Yeah, their ideological purity is really under attack here. Yeah, because they, yeah. They, 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 there is absolutely no they idea. Yeah, they don't actually have it. It's about controlling women's bodies. It's not about life. It's not about the baby. They just want ba- they just want more. They just want women to be children's factories. That's why they're cool with IVFs. That's why they're saying we need more kids. <laughs> I think you're going too far. You think I'm going too far with that? Yeah. Well, I think I think you're you're I think you're foregoing compassion to make a, a more radical statement on it. I think what compassion are you talking about? I, like like the fact that these are actually people's beliefs. And they don't they don't hold them for malicious reasons of of controlling other people and rather, I don't see any beliefs here. That's my issue. That it's, that that life does begin at conception. Right. No one believes that. None of these elected officials believe that. I think. Um. I mean, maybe they don't. I th- well, you can't I think believe so. that. And before IVF, no, I th- IVF is literally killing things. Then, then you're killing people. No, you're not killing people because IVF is still IVF still allows you to have babies from those embryos no no but you kill embryos to get that baby born what when i told you before like every ivf treatment Mm -hmm. there are multiple embryos that get embedded for the because it's so expensive a procedure so five might get embedded one might survive there's also cases and this is the vast majority of cases to survive 
but they only want one kid, so they throw the other two out. Yes, but the but the vast but these are still embryos that otherwise would just go unfertilized. Embryos most of the well, time. Embryos that would go unfertilized doesn't make sense because an embryo is fertilized. The definition of an embryo is sperm egg together. Okay. I don't know enough about female biology. So that's what we're saying. So we have two babies that are being thrown by the from the Republicans perspective. IVF takes two babies, Mm. throws them in the garbage to birth one baby. Okay. Well, they're not coming at this from a utilitarian analysis or anything. Do you not think there, there is something like there is a real belief about just having more babies? No, that's fine. That's awesome. I love that idea, but it is totally inconsistent with the belief of, that embryos are children. I I don't think it it's, can't be. I think it can be both. How? I think it can be like yes. I we want we want. It can be like like two things can be true at once. You can want more babies, but also not want to kill babies, and so you find some kind of balance between those to say, okay, I'm still okay with having these these more these embryos become full grown born people at the cost of some other embryos. But I just want you to understand, from their people. logic then, if they truly believe that embryos are people, then they're killing some people to let other people live. That's what they're doing. Yes. That's fucking crazy, right? If that's truly how they're thinking, what I'm saying is they're not actually thinking that way. No. No, it's like what they're really thinking like is there's a spectrum of being a person. Right. And if they can admit that there's a spectrum of being the person, then, then everything they're talking about is all bullshit. Sure. The second that they admit that there's a spectrum, mm. then life doesn't begin at conception. Mm. And if life doesn't begin at conception, then everything you've been fighting for for the last four decades has just been all lies. Okay. You've been saying life begins at conception for 50 years. Uh, so, yeah. And not only have they been saying this for 50 years, they actually have a bill titled the Life at Conception Act. This aims to extend the legal protection of life to fetuses from the moment of conception, effectively granting them full human rights under the law. What does this mean? It means that every single embryo will have the equal protection clause and granted in them with the 14th Amendment of the Constitution. So that will give fetuses, uh, embryos, fetuses, whatever, the 14th Amendment protection. The bill completely eliminates IVF treatment. It does not carve out IVF anything. Hmm. So this in so again, I already explained the whole IVF procedure. 124 Republicans have co-sponsored the legislation. Multiple of them have actually come out and said that they would never ban IVF treatment, even as they're signed on a bill that bans IVF treatment. <laughs> They are. It is crazy how they're talking out two sides of their mouth in a way that I can't even fathom. What it tells me is that these Republicans don't read the bills. No, I agree. I think they don't understand the bill. They have no. They don't know what the bill means. They again. They haven't all thought the about car. this contingency. They haven't. I don't think they've thought a day in their life, let alone this contingency. So now, Nancy Mace is one Republican who has not co-sponsored this year's version of the bill, but did co-sponsor the bill back in 2021, she's trying to triangulate on the issue. She's trying to find the happy middle ground. So she is pushing for a non-binding resolution to say that IVF is good and it should be legal everywhere. Democrats are proposing a bill that would protect IVF everywhere and ensure that no state could ever ban it. Nancy Mace doesn't like that. She only likes the non-binding resolution that has really, really strong language that says IVF is just so important, but does nothing to punish or bar states from banning the practice if they try to. So it's all virtue signal bullshit. These people have caught they, these people have got caught on the national stage being religious, zealous, theocratic freaks, and they don't know how to deal with it. Because if you run a campaign on the party that bans IVF, you're going to lose, and you deserve to lose, and you deserve to never have power again. So hopefully the Democrats can exploit the hell out of this and make sure every Republican who's co-sponsored on this or has ever co-sponsored anything previously, either. Everyone make sure that they know that they're illiterate and don't read the bills they sign up for, uh, don't have the mental capacity to understand the side effects and the contingencies of what they vote on and what they support, or that they're all just liars who don't believe life begins at concession and just wants to control the woman's body. I still think you're you're being too harsh. How, I, I, just, I think you're not giving them enough of the benefit of the doubt because, sure, you can say that they are technically liars for if they don't actually believe that life begin the conception that there is some kind of spectrum mm-hmm. of humanness right but then every politician 
has something that they have trouble walking back and like finding the exact wording that they can thread through the media in a way that isn't going to get them called out. So I understand like they are obfuscating. They mm-hmm. are trying to avoid saying that exact thing and yeah. like and keep their base pleased. Um, and I think it is important to point that out. But I don't think it is. I don't. I think you're exaggerating by portraying it as some like absolute um abomination or like having a total outcry about it i feel like th- this is not something that is uh unique to evangelicals and people who say that they think life begins at conception i don't think i think evangelicals do believe life begins at conception i don't think these elected people do you don't think any of these elected people are actually evangelicals? Like no, no, Mike no, no, no. Johnson. They might be evangelicals, but that doesn't mean that they have to believe life. I do not think that anyone who is okay with IVF believes life begins at conception. I don't think it's possible. I don't think it, it literally isn't possible. So you think there, you think, but what about just the people who haven't thought it through? Like, don't you think there's a lot of evangelicals oh, 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 out there that, that oh, oh, think Oh, you're about right. No, you're right. You're right. You're totally right. They could either be extremely stupid or abject liars. It's either or. I don't think it's extremely stupid. I think, I think... This is like the second question you ask when you say that an embryo is a baby. Sure, but is, but have they even had asked, been asked if an embryo is a baby before well, this? Don't you ask yourself every, when you think about it? Like, don't, don't you like, ch- like, don't you think about the beliefs you have before you like write bills about them and then sign on to them? This is why I can't take these people seriously, bro. Hmm. Right? Like, if, if this is going to be your thing, Mike Johnson runs on a pro-life mm. life that begins at conception agenda. And then the second a court finally tells you life begins at conception, he's like, no, it doesn't. Yeah. Nope. No, it doesn't. Doesn't do that. Mm. I'm sorry. Doesn't do that. We need more babies, actually, at the end of the day. We need more babies. Mm. Oh, but I, I just, it blows my mind. Okay. Blows my I mind. I hear you. I hear you. Blows my mind. So that's where the Republican Party is now. We're, they're trying to reverse IVF treatment. And uh, can't forget that. And I hope every Democrat runs on this because it's insane. And this is another thing, okay? No, This is why I have issues with moderate Republicans. You might have a moderate Republican in your New York or California House district. That's fine. But when you give the House of Representatives, the when you give the Republicans the majority in the House of Representatives, Republicans from Mississippi, Alabama, and Tennessee get on committees and become the chair of committees that run the country. So yeah, you might think, oh, I'm just voting for this moderate Republican who doesn't believe IVF is bad. Okay, that's fine. Well, you're going to have a guy from Tennessee who's on the health committee who does believe that IVF needs to go away. And he co-sponsored this piece of legislation. So voting for a moderate Republican is not safe, even if he personally is okay with IVF. Yeah, and it also just adds a number to their tally to yeah. be able to pass through the bills of whoever does sponsor these kinds of bills. Yeah. Because as we see consistently, they, people just vote along party lines. We talk about how the candidate matters um, as far as getting elected, but I think that's a big difference. The candidate tends to matter much more in a campaign mm-hmm. than they do as a member of the House of Representatives, at least, I think the senators, the individual a senators, different. is a little different. Yeah. I think they're more of leaders mm-hmm. on their own. Um, but in the House, it's it's a numbers game like, between what the ta- parties. What, what were we talking about with Tom Suozzi, right? Tom Suozzi was probably the only Democrat who was going to win New York District 3 by nine points. Yeah. Probably the only Democrat who could have done that. But he's going to vote with Joe Biden 100% of the time, just like he did in the last session. Even though when he campaigned, he was specifically saying the left has gone too far in this way, in this way, in this way. Yeah. Right. He, he He's just going to be the left. He's, he's totally just going to vote for Biden the whole way. Yeah. Oh, that's it. So totally. that's what any moderate Republican will do to him. Yes. Yes. So are you ready? I'm I'm ready. I I'm think ready. this is going to be a short one. Uh, yeah. We just sh- want to give a lay of the land of some stuff. It's going to be a shallower deep dive. Yeah. Um, But it's we're coming up on Super Tuesday. In uh, about a week, Mm -hmm. maybe a week. Um, And the Super Tuesday, right, we always think about presidential primaries, and that's where all of the attention usually goes. But some of these congressional primaries will decide kind of, it it decides the parties. Last week, we did a deep dive on different political alignments and how those are shifting, right, based on like what values on the issues are the parties aligning themselves with. Well, these people who get elected 
in the primaries to go on to represent their states in Congress, they're the ones who decide what that alignment is going to be. It is the president to some extent too, right? But then you see in the Republican Party where Trump has has cleaved it and he's caused this clear split where you have like the McConnell-led Warhawk type Republicans. Mm -hmm. Um, The more that the McConnell types get elected into the Senate, the more that that version of the Republican Party survives versus the more the Trump type senators get elected, um, the more that the Republican Party becomes aligned with Trump. Right. So I think specifically we have three Senate primaries yeah. that we want to talk about here. The first one is California. So after Dianne Feinstein died, I think it was last year, late last year, mm-hmm. um, Gavin Newsom appointed LaFonza Butler as her replacement. But LaFonza Butler isn't running again for the Senate. So this is actually the first time that a California Senate seat is opening in about 30 years, wow. since 1992. Why didn't know that? Um, California is possibly, probably the bluest state in the nation. Mm-hmm. Uh, so the primary might be the most important election, although how California works is the primary just decides who the final two are going to be, and then they vote on those final two in November. Those final two can still be Democrats. It's called a jungle primary. So like Mm -hmm. they'll have a list of like eight people and then the top two go on to a final round. Yeah. And so there are really four front runners and I'll start with the, the one Republican, uh, his name is Steve Garvey. He's a former Los Angeles Dodger baseball player. I didn't know um, that. And honestly, the, the consensus is he is just someone with name recognition who's been thrown to the wolves just so the Republicans can have a presence there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? Just so that he doesn't even know what his own stances on these issues are because he's so new to this. He said, quote, once we get through the primary, I'll start a deeper dive into the issues. Oh, God, dude. That's I haven't so embarrassing. I haven't been at this very long, so you got to get me a little bit of leeway here. Wait, that's actually like so sweet and wholesome. <laughs> I prefer that than someone lying to me. I guess, oh, but I, like I, I wouldn't vote for it. No, God, no. <laughs> I wouldn't vote for him. I would hold his hand and tuck him in, but like, yeah. that's so cute. It's yeah. like, I don't know. Yeah, give me some time, guys. I'm new to this. Yeah. It's like that, you know that, you know that meme where it's, like, it's going around right now with like the hamster that's like cute? With the sound where it's like... I haven't seen it. Damn. Maybe maybe some people over here on TikTok will understand. But it's like a cop. It's like, get out your license and registration. And then it, like you swipe to the next picture. And it's like it's a little hamster with cute eyes being like, can I call my mom? Okay. And that's like what's happening here. It's like, what's your position on the issues? He's like, I, I don't know. Yeah. You know? Kind of. So he... He, one thing we know is he's voted for Trump in the last two elections. He's refused to say whether he will vote for Trump again in this election. Pussy. Obviously, that is major points against him in the California primary. The, the weird thing is he's not polling terribly. No, he's not. And he's, some he's polling around like like right behind the second front runner Democrat, um, yeah. who we'll get into really quickly here. But um, it's one interesting thing is both of the two front running Democrats have tried to. No, no, the the top front running Democrat yes. has tried to boost Garvey so that he, Garvey is the one that he's running against in November. So let's switch up. Let's go to the top sub, top Democrat. So Adam Schiff is the Democrat who's leading in the polls right now. He's a representative um, in the House, and he has he has the most name recognition probably for leading the first impeachment inquiry into Donald Trump. Um, Adam Schiff. And I'll get into the second one first, just so we can make comparisons. Mm-hmm. The The second leading Democrat is Katie Porter. So she is she's a protege of Elizabeth Warren. Yes. Uh, she's kind of the, your economic populist. She says big companies are bad. Um, they're the reason for most of our woes. She does the really well. Bad. She does really well on pharma regulation. Sure. That's yeah. a big thing for her. Um, so she she's really focused on domestic policy. And then the last one is Barbara Lee. Yes. Barbara Lee is a longtime representative in the House. She is the more progressive choice. Yeah, she is the she, uh, progressive flock to her early on. AOC is big supporter of Barbara Lee. Yeah. Um, Bernie Sanders is massively supportive of Barbara Lee. She, she gained national recognition after 9-11 for voting against going to war in Afghanistan. Yeah. She is the only member of Congress to do so. Um, so this has made her the go-to choice for progressives for a long time. Um, a lot of progressives absolutely love her, but she doesn't have genuinely the best ideas. And as a progressive, I feel comfortable saying that. Okay. She has indicated that she wants a $50 minimum wage. Yeah. Which is pretty nuts. It's crazy. It's obviously ridiculous. That's, yes. That's, that's not feasible. Yeah. So uh, just on that alone, I'd probably vote for Katie Porter if I was in that situation. Yeah. Adam Schiff is interesting. He like 
he is a Democrat through and through. He's never going to be a maverick. He's going to vote party lines all the way through. Yeah. But he's not the type of guy I want to lead the party. Okay. He's not the type of guy I want to lead the party. Why is that? He seems too corporatist for me. Yeah. He seems too corporatist. It, it, it might, his voting record might not say it as such, right? But he is not a bulwark the way Katie Porter would be a bulwark against big pharma yeah. and big corporations. Adam Schiff will vote with Katie Porter, but he's not going to write the legislation that Katie Porter would write. Yeah. Katie Porter specifically doesn't take any money from big donors. Yeah. He doesn't take any money from PACs. Adam Schiff cannot say the same thing. No, he cannot. Porter takes all of her money from small dollar donations. Um, but so the thing is, Schiff has been trying to propel Garvey because he wants to run against Garvey rather than Porter when yeah. it comes to the election. Um, one, I think the main... So these people, these Democrats, would mostly vote the same, right, when they get elected. One place that there's a clear difference is Israel-Palestine. Yes. Adam Schiff has been all in on support for Israel. He's completely in support. Barbara Lee is completely out. Barbara Lee is totally in favor of a ceasefire. Yeah. Katie Porter doesn't really know. Yeah. Katie, she's like she's scared to take a stance. She is. But she's also in a weird spot, right? Because all the progressives are flocking to Barbara Lee. All the moderates slash like Democrat resist libs like I hate Trumps are going to Adam Schiff because he yeah. impeached the orange man, mm -hmm. right? So then you have Katie Porter who's trying to ride the middle lane, right, between these two sides. But she can't say that she's all for Palestine because then she loses all that. So she's just trying to ride the line. Yes, she. But she. But her way of riding, she can't really. I don't think she's articulated a middle ground mm. path that well. No, like that's she's. A fair, that's a fair point. They've had multiple debates and they've tried to press her on it. And they're like, "So do you support a ceasefire or not?" And she's like, "Ceasefire isn't a magic word. You can't just say it and then make it happen. There needs to be other conditions to have it." go through which is fine and true but she doesn't describe what those conditions are or, she doesn't have a vision or what's her opinion yeah right or what's your opinion i understand that it's not something that could be happening right now would you like it to happen yeah right exactly so um yeah i i who do you like the most i like katie porter the most really i've liked katie porter for a while um i think barbara lee is great but i do not think that voting for someone who wants a fifty dollar minimum wage is reasonable. That's just not something I could. Okay. Do. I, I, I th think that's too much. I man. think I would do Barbara Lee. You think I so? I think I would vote Barbara Lee because she'll never get the fifty dollar minimum wage. That's fair. And if you want to push the Overton window, right? I get that. She does that because one of the things that she's proposed is investing one trillion dollars into the National Housing Trust Fund. That's huge. To build up more public housing and more support for it. Mm -hmm. Housing has been a huge issue in these debates because of the issues in California, obviously. Yeah. Um, and I think, again, that's something where the Overton window does need to be pushed. Mm -hmm. Right now, we only have, we only invest like $10 billion into the Housing Trust Fund, right. the Public Housing Trust Fund. So um, all of these Democrats, I think, would invest more, but I think Lee would probably push it the most. Yeah, I think... I think I'm more impressed with Katie Porter's like domestic economic record, mm. right? Like the way, like in her committee hearings where she's ripping apart Big Pharma or ripping apart Jamie Dimon, right? Like yes. those are moments where it's like, okay, this is someone who's a good orator and like is a good spokesperson for her ideals. Uh, Barbara Lee is a great spokesperson and a good spokesperson for her ideas. I don't see the same type of like, hmm combativeness against industry in the same way that Katie Porter has been able to demonstrate. And I think Katie Porter could take that to legislation where Barbara Lee might and couldn't. Um, also, from a more political perspective, perhaps Barbara Lee is like too progressive for her own good in the Senate where like people won't work with her because the same way some people don't like to work with Bernie Sanders because he's too far left. Yeah. Right. OK. But then there's like a then there's a pragmatic element to it. But I don't know if that's a good reason not to vote for somebody. It's hard for me to it's hard for me to know. Yeah. Maybe hard. I'm more up in the air than I thought. Yeah. About it. But you're definitely not Schiff. I'm definitely not Schiff. Because of the corporatism and the Israel support. Yeah. I'm definitely either Porter or Lee. I, I, I used I, to be all Lee. Now I'm kind of poor. Now I don't see, really See, I give care. props to Lee for for being pro Palestine. No, me like too. Being so pro that's ceasefire, a, right? That's, that's a hard thing to do. That's big. And it's I mean, and Porter is not clearly pro ceasefire. Mm -hmm. And Schiff is clearly anti ceasefire right so that's like an actual yeah. difference that's a that's a very substantial difference yeah um i hope 
the best thing for the Democratic Party is that Garvey comes in second place. You think so? Yes, because Garvey cannot win the general election. No. So if it's two Democrats in California, those two Democrats will be raising a lot of money fighting each other, and all that money should be going to Montana and Ohio. Okay. And they're going to be sucking up those that money from around the country that should really be going to Montana or Ohio. Okay. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I hope Garvey comes in second and Porter in first. All the polls have, it's like shift Porter, Garvey, Lee, or shift Garner, Porter, Lee. I actually see Garvey. Yeah, I have shift Garvey right recently. Garvey and Porter have generally been neck and neck. Garvey yeah. is ahead by, it looks like, a few point like a point and a half over Porter right now. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, see. So Yeah. And but Schiff is Schiff is ahead by far. Yeah, Schiff's gonna come in first place no matter what. Yeah. What a great political decision on him to put his face on national TV every day with that impeachment impeachment inquiry stuff, man. Yeah. I mean if you're in California, right, that is kowtowing to the base. Yeah. That's exactly right. Okay. And now let's go over to the Ohio Senate primary. Yes. So we have three leaders here. We got Bernie Moreno Frank LaRose and Matt Dolan. Yeah. Okay. Frank LaRose, he is the Secretary of State of Ohio, and he made a pretty big national name for himself a couple months ago with an Ohio referendum to ban abortion in the state. Or, no, no, I'm sorry. Um, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. He was. Tr- he wanted to make it harder to amend the Ohio Constitution, which was seen as a proxy vote for abortion because later in the year yes ohio voters were looking to enshrine abortion as a constitutional right yes he was trying to get abortion referendums to be 60 percent instead of 50 yes right so then the abortion referendum did pass by like 57 percent. so now frank larose made a name for himself as being like an anti-abortion guy which is not really the best thing to tie yourself to in ohio no 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 so He makes his name for himself there, and then he loses that race that he was really in charge of running the campaign for. So then he gets a little embarrassed because he loses by like 10 plus points, Mm -hmm. right? So then that's not really good for his name recognition. So that's Frank LaRose. Then we have Matt Dolan. Matt Dolan is a pretty well-known state representative in Ohio. He, I don't know much about him, but he's more of the establishment pick. Yeah, a little bit more. Right, a little bit more of the establishment pick. I would say Frank LaRose is the establishment pick. Yeah. And then Frank LaRose. Oh, I'm sorry. And then Matt Dolan. And then we get Bernie Moreno. Yeah. Now, Bernie Moreno was a car salesman for a while. Um, this is his first time running for any type of political office. Uh, and he has Trump's endorsement. Yeah. Trump's endorsement. J.D. Vance's endorsement. Jim Jordan's endorsement. All yeah. of the hard writers are lining up behind Bernie Moreno. Yeah. They are. This is his guy. I honestly think this might be a tiny bit conspiracy-ish, but I think Bernie Moreno had a meeting with Trump, pledged loyalty, got yes, the support. Dude, I totally think he pledged loyalty to yeah. Trump, 100%. Because Bernie Moreno has no record to go off of, no. and Trump's most valued asset is loyalty. Well, Bernie Moreno actually has somewhat of a liberal track record. He has a where, liberal history. He's written op-eds about like increasing renewable energy infrastructure and investment in renewable energy he's wrote op-eds about making like abortion legal about no he's wrote op-eds about immigration about um a path to citizenship yep. for I- illegal immigrants who are in the country right now and all that is gone now yeah he agrees with none of the things he ever wrote yeah he's no. done with all of this so somehow i think he he might be just looking to grab power possibly huh who would have thought um, he, he said a lot of controversial stuff um, recently. One thing I always mention is he like floated the idea of giving reparations to white union, the descendants of white union soldiers for ending slavery instead of reparations for black people. It's crazy. That's one of the craziest things I've ever heard. Yeah. Um, I swear to God, he said it. You can you can look up the video where he's talking about it. And he's not even saying it like it's a joke. Like he, he said it with his whole chest. Um, so that, that's kind of Bernie Moreno's vibe. He's, he's what the one other thing I'll say he's, so he's a businessman and he's also recently faced like lawsuits for underpaying his employees oh. and otherwise discriminating against them. God, oh. I, need, I need to get Oh, this is perfect this. for Trump. What a good, that one in the same. Yep. One, one, one in the same. Perfect mm-hmm. for him. Um, Bernie Moreno also not great on union stuff. He has not indicated anything with regards to the UAW strikes. He showed absolutely zero support to the, all of them. So that's Bernie Moreno, Frank LaRose, and Matt Dolan all don't support the UAW stuff that's been going on recently. Yeah. Yep. Um, and that differs from what the Democrat 
uh, incumbent has done. Sherrod Brown has been one of the largest union supporters in the country. He has been Sherrod Brown is the incumbent senator from Ohio. He was first elected to the Senate in 2006. He has been very, very tight on banking regu- regulation, very, very good on working rights and unionization rights and collective bargaining rights. That's yeah. been his whole thing. Yes. You know? Totally. So these are the three guys. Bernie Moreno, Frank LaRose, Matt Dillon. Okay. I found the thing about Bernie Moreno. He was found, he was sanctioned by a court, Bernie Moreno, for shredding documents amidst a lawsuit that accused him of wage theft. That is hilarious. Isn't that crazy? Don't you go to jail for that? Um, that probably probably just fined. Maybe just um, fine. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe it was like a, it's probably not. Maybe it's a maybe it's a civil thing, so it's not a crime. Well, because they they only they ordered Moreno to pay already to pay four hundred thousand dollars to two former employees wow. at his Massachusetts dealership, um, and then he admitted in a deposition to shredding documents containing information that was relevant to the case. That's amazing. God, that's hilarious. That is hilarious, dude. Wow. Maybe he's maybe he's giving Trump strategies about the court stuff. Maybe that's what yeah happened. exactly. Yeah. No, the the last thing I'll say is about Larose. Larose found finds himself as the Secretary of State in this interesting position of since Trump has made it such a point that elections are fraudulent, elections aren't trustworthy. He gets to run on saying my elections have been rock solid. Like even though saying the national elections, still casting doubt on those national elections, and even Trump has posted on social media to in not he hasn't endorsed LaRose because obviously we just said he endorsed Moreno mm-hmm. but he has endorsed LaRose's um track record on elections wow that's really interesting yeah that's super interesting so it'll be yeah, I definitely lane. think it was between Moreno and LaRose for sure okay and it was definitely like a hard call I know Bernie Moreno just gave so much loyalty to Trump so early on mm. like he's been sucking his dick for so long yeah and it'll, it'll be an interesting it'll be another test does the trump backed candidate win the primary and then do they lose the general yeah i mean so we've seen that pattern so many times and so let's look at the the stances of the politics right now where are these in the polling well bernie moreno was in second to third place in the very beginning of all this we actually put out a video on the important senate elections of 2024 and we talked about the polling at the time and i think bernie moreno was in last at that okay time. And then I said in that video that it's all going to change the second Trump gives out the endorsement. Because the second Trump endorses Bernie Moreno, he's going to jump up 20, 30 points and be running ahead. What are the numbers now? I'm seeing latest poll from Emerson College. Moreno, 22. LaRose, 21. Dolan, 15. There we go. That's way closer than I thought. Super close. I can't believe it's that close with LaRose and uh, 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 Moreno. I also can't believe that there's that many undecided so late in the game. Yeah. Like it's not so late in the game. I think the the I think the primary is in August or something like maybe that. Maybe the poll was set up. Um, I, I I mean the the numbers on this make it seem like maybe those are only Republicans that were polled, or like like the the numbers like everyone was polled, but then most of the Democrats said like oh no not no applicable no I wouldn't do that okay no no that's not how the primary polls work okay but. Yeah, there's a lot of undecideds. I still think Moreno's going to carry it down pretty quick. I think Trump's going to go in there, give like two speeches, and then it's going to be over for everyone else. Okay. You know? Um, I mean, that's been the track record. But then it goes into what you were saying. Does the Trump back candidate who wins the primary end up losing the general? Yeah. And if there's anybody who can carry Ohio on the Senate level while Donald Trump carries it on the presidential level, it's Sherrod Brown. Sherrod Brown's been through it with the Ohio electorate. 2006, 2012, 2018. 2000 now 2024 dude's been around he knows how to run a campaign yeah um and he knows how to organize the union support to get that vote out he's done that plenty of times Mm. so he's going to keep doing it it's going to be a hard race quickly before we move on to the last one i want to talk about montana okay there was going to be a primary in montana between tim sheehy and matt rosendale these are two republicans who are running to face off against john tester the incumbent democrat uh, from Montana. And Tim Sheehy was the establishment pick. Matt Rosendale was not. He was the more hard writer. Matt Rosendale declared that he was going to run for Senate. Okay. The next day, Donald Trump endorses Tim Sheehy, undercuts Matt Rosendale's whole case for running. Then Matt Rosendale drops out the next day. Why do you think Trump endorsed Sheehy? Here is my theory. Matt Rosendale has uh, uh, recently impregnated his 20-year-old congressional aide. Really? (laughs) Too much scandal even for Trump, Too much scandal even for Trump, Really? I think so. I think impregnating your 20-year-old... 
man. Is he married? Yeah. Wait, I actually don't know if he's married. I took that for granted. Okay. Let's, let's look that up real quick. Okay. So that was the whole Matt Rosendale situation. See, I thought it was I thought it was more she he just has a better chance to win and Trump is trying to align himself with the winner for once. That would be listen, that would be that would be good politicking on Trump's part for once. Yeah. You know, it's possible. Mm -hmm. I don't know. But I really want to see if he's married. So yeah, Matt Rosendale threatens to sue after ex senator claims he impregnated Stafford. Mm -hmm. So here we go. Um that's that. Rosendale and his wife, Jean, reside on a ranch north there, of Glendive. There you go. Yeah, the other way. So that's not good for anybody. Um, wow. Yeah. Don't like Matt Rosendale, but um, no, you get what's coming to you. Okay. <laughs> so now Michigan Dem primary. This one is the only Democratic primary. Oh, oh my God. He's been married for 40 years. <laughs> I hope it's true. God. That's hilarious. God, that's so bad. Holy crap. Oh. But I do. Let's go back for a second. I do think it was too much scandal for Trump. I think even he knows. Really? Yeah, I think he knows endorsing somebody who impregnated their twenty-year-old staffer is not a okay. That can't be right. Okay. Okay. So Michigan primary. This is, I think, one of the best avenues. This is the next battlefield in the corporate versus progressive wing of the Democratic Party. In California, it's a little split, right? You have Schiff, you have Porter, you have Lee. You, people are probably out there making arguments that L Schiff can be more progressive in some areas and stuff. Like there are probably arguments going on. So it's not as clear cut of a case yeah. that it's like progressive versus corporatist. Mm. Um, this one, this one's a little more exact. So it's between Elisa Slotkin and Hill Harper. Now, He'll, I'll start with Elisa Slotkin because she is the assumed winner. She's like the favorite in this race. Mm. So she's a former CIA staffer. She worked um, on Iraqi intelligence prior to the Iraq war. That's where she got her campaign. That's where she got her career started. Not suggesting it's any way her fault. She was a low-level staffer at the time. Some people like to claim that she was like, she's the reason all these lies came. To Not at all. She was like a low-level staffer. Okay. Just where she got started. Um, then she worked uh, with, you know, uh, foreign affairs stuff under the Obama administration. Then she became an elected representative from a swing district in Michigan. Now, she made some iffy remarks during this campaign and after. One about abortion. She didn't specifically say um, whether or not life began at conception. She didn't say a yes or no answer to that question. She also didn't say yes or no answer to the question of would you codify Roe into legislation. She didn't give a yes or no to that. She was mm. kind of iffy. Mm. This is back in 2018, 2019. Might have changed by now, but when I go on her website, doesn't she doesn't put it up there. She doesn't say that she's gonna. Mm. I haven't seen anything that she says she's gonna. So that's a little hard. That's important too. That's an important one. That's really important because she could her non-vote could be a deciding non-vote. She also hasn't said that she wants to get rid of the filibuster. So getting mm. rid of the filibuster is another thing that's kind of important for progressives right now. Yes. Because like we want to codify Roe, and you can't do that unless you get rid of the filibuster. Yeah. Right. So if I go to her homepage and I look at the issues that she's talking about, she doesn't mention unions on it a lot. She does. She does. I'm sorry. She doesn't mention unions at all. Not to say that she doesn't mention unions a lot. She doesn't mention unions once. She does go after pharmaceutical companies. She goes really hard on big pharma. She talks about how she was really proud to vote for the Inflation Reduction Act and how that reduced prescription drug costs for seniors. So I'm really glad her out there talking about that. She talks about making chips in America. She's super happy about the Chips Act mm. and stuff like that. But she doesn't say anything like, she wants to pass the PRO Act or something, right? I okay. don't see, like, I want to expand collective bargaining rights beyond what they are right now. Mm. I'm not seeing that type of rhetoric from her. Okay. Very, it seems very moderate. seems very not pushing the envelope. What makes me worried is we... And the reason I'm focusing on this race here is because I'm worried. I don't want to elect another Kirsten Cinema. Yeah. You know what I mean? Totally. I don't want to elect someone who we think is going to be okay and vote Democrat all the way, but actually has some more skeletons in their closet and might not and you know might not pass to overdo the filibuster we don't need more mark warners and joe and joe and, mansions yeah she's not a joe mansion i don't want to put that much on her right you know what i mean why not because i don't think she's like that okay i don't think that she would be uh, against like um 
What's a big thing that Joe Manchin is against then? I don't think she would be against like a public option for health insurance. Okay. Like, you know what I mean? Okay. The, same, the way Joe Manchin would be. But let's go over to Hill Harper. Hill Harper is a different story. He's not been a politician. He's a, He was an actor or is an actor. He's a part of the actors union and plays a leading role in the in the actors union mm. he's a big supporter of that and a big advocate for all that he's running his campaign on basically a progressive agenda through and through he's talking about raising the minimum wage to 15 dollars an hour he's talking about expanding workers rights and strengthening the collective bargaining and support a worker's right to organize he says that explicitly, and then he's talking about supporting small businesses. That's kind of his economic agenda. Then he has a whole tab specifically towards ending the filibuster. Mm -hmm. So he makes that an exact point to end the filibuster and make that an important issue. And he talks about how that is good, what we need to ensure women's rights and pass Roe into codifying that into law. Um, then he goes on to talk about climate justice specifically and how that is super important. Um, Alyssa Slotkin doesn't mention climate change in her, in her like issues tab when she's running on her stuff. Um, she does mention like protecting democracy, which is not something that whole Harper mentions, but that goes without saying, I think, you know, running in a democratic primary mentioning the defense of democracy doesn't do all too much. No, I, I don't know what Cause every Democrat's going to defend democracy against Trump. Yes. You would think, yeah, I right. Agree. So, like, he's touting that. Well, Adam Schiff has also been running on yes, he um, has. defending democracy, and part of that is like specific, like going above and beyond, kind of in strengthening the institutions, via right? Laws, right, right, right. If, if if she ties this to like a new Voting Rights Act, exactly, that makes me very happy. Sure, right. So, I'm going to say again, I don't think the stakes in this election are that high. I don't think uh, electing an Alyssa Slotkin is like. A nightmare scenario. It's not likely a cinema. But a 20% chance is too high for me. Yeah. And so if I have the choice to go with somebody who's advertising that they want a $15, min $15 minimum wage and mm -hmm. someone who's not advertising that or someone how they want to pass the PRO Act and someone who's not advertising that, I'm going to pick the person who's advertising that. Yeah. You know? Definitely. And Hill Harper's also an awesome speaker. He has, he has fantastic speeches, which is important as a senator. You have to be a good orator if you're going to do that. Yeah. Alyssa so, Slotkin's not terrible, but, you know, she's not as good. We're going to see the results to this tonight. No, no, no. This this primary is in August. Oh. This Senate primary is over in August. Okay. Okay. That means good. There's there's time there's for— There's time. There's time for you know what? Hill after, Harper to make up. After talking about this, I think I'm going to donate to Hill Harper tonight. Yeah. After talking about this, I think I think it's in. I think I'm I, I I have more of a desire to see Alyssa Slotkin lose after talking about this. Do you think the problem right now is probably name recognition, or yeah. do you think Michigan voters really do align more with Slotkin's no, values? No, I don't think values. it's that they align more Slotkin's values. If they saw that Hill Harper was like on the UAW march line, right, mm. and doing all that stuff. I think they would very much line up behind him. Okay. I do think she has proven to be a successful politician in Michigan. She has won in a swing district twice, mm. right? Hill Harper is an unknown quantity. Yeah. And I think people might be worried of putting an untested person near the top of their ticket. Okay. I get that. Right. I, I hope they look at it more as, as this is exciting. Yeah. Right? It's exciting to have an outsider, a new person come in. Yeah. Yeah. And Hill yeah. Harper's been great. He's been a big supporter of Bernie Sanders throughout the years, I think. Cool. So he's been good on that stuff. So that's like the big progressive corporatist battle that I'm looking forward to. The polls aren't looking too good for Hill Harper right now. Oh, but he's also he's got, losing by like 40. But he's got a lot of time. He's got months. Yeah. He's got months of time. He isn't broke, which is good. From, my, from reports I've heard, he isn't broke. So Yeah, that is good. I don't think he takes super PAC money. Nope. Or PAC no, money. No just PAC based money. on his his website um no no pack yeah money. and i mean the time thing does seem matter more i think a lot more in congressional primaries yeah because this is the type of thing that i don't know that if you're in if you live in the state you look up like the week before to learn about the candidates and then you're like okay yeah now i know who i want to vote yeah. for and listen michigan's a weird state man don't forget 2016 the polling averages had hillary clinton winning michigan against bernie sanders by 22 points bernie won it by three won it by two or something like that mm. so you never know you never know with the polls, period. You never know with the polls, period. And progressives are popular in a lot of places in Michigan, especially if you're a union progressive. Yeah. You know, if exactly. you're a union progressive, you can make some fucking headway. Yeah. There's some clout, you know? So, yeah, guys. Um, that deep dive was actually really good, I think. I liked that. That was really good. Yeah. I do like analyzing politicians. Yeah. Right? Like, I like analyzing the issues and, like, figuring out how to solve problems. Mm -hmm. um, but I also like, like, part of, then the way to express 
that opinion ends up being who are you going to actually choose? Well, politics is war by another means, as Karl von Clausewitz would say. So I like the idea of how you get all your policies done is you got to win, you know? Yeah. And studying how these people win is really fascinating. Yeah. And we're going to talk a lot about the strategies of the campaigns as the months go on. 